Okay, students, we are at topic 12 on Aries. Okay, so before that, we have been talking about uh, alkanes and alkenes. So if you want a little bit of um, a very short revision on what exactly um, is the difference between alkanes and alkenes, I think you might have recalled that for alkenes, there exists a CC double bond or at least one CC double bond, as compared to alkanes where it contains just all uh, single bonds um, between carbon, carbon, and carbon and H's. So usually for, for alkanes, we, we call them saturated, and for alkenes, um, unsaturated, Yeah, because uh, each of the carbon is not able to form the maximum number of uh, single bonds in which they could. Yeah, and if you, if you recall from the basic chemistry, which... Uh, you learn from alkenes is that alkenes generally undergoes electrophilic addition and the reason why they do that is because the presence of the pi bond which uh, is sort of its weakest link so the pi bond is electron rich and then it will tend to approach electron deficient center so um, in general you learn about um, the reaction uh, between alkenes and HX, where H is electron deficient, X is a halogen. So the pi bond will actually attack the H um, through its uh, electron-rich uh, pi system, and then uh, you will grab one of the H, and then you form a carbocation, and then um, uh, so and so forth. Okay, so uh, yeah, so you you should be pretty familiar with alkenes and alkenes before you embark on the new chapter on arenes, because arenes is actually quite different uh, from alkenes, despite the fact that arenes also contains um, multiple double bonds. <coughs> okay, so uh, we'll just dive straight in um, without actually looking at the learning objective. Okay, so uh, in general, arenes are aromatic compounds. Um, I mean, to be more explicit here, refer to hydrocarbon, but uh, in general, any compounds uh, which contains at least a phenol ring. Okay, so... Uh, Terminology-wise, if you have one benzene ring, which is C6H6, we call this a benzene ring. However, if the benzene ring is actually part of a, a system, like for example in benzaldehyde, it is actually part of the aldehyde, and then for methyl benzene, um, one of the H is replaced by uh, the benzene ring. Uh, in the correct terminology to call these two benzene rings right, is actually phenol ring. Okay, some people call it phenol ring. Okay, so um, yeah, so it depends on how you want to pronounce it. Okay, so um, it's called the phenol ring. That's actually more exact. Uh, in short, it can be represented uh, with the molecular formula C6H5. That's understandable uh, because there's there shouldn't be any ambiguity when you when you write as C6H5, but uh, in general, we just call it the phenol ring. Okay, so are we able to have uh, more than one um, uh, phenol ring or benzene ring um, bonded together? Yes, you can have. So, for example, you can have naphthalene. Naphthalene is actually the moth ball, which um, probably your parents uh, or, or you yourself even put in the wardrobe to actually prevent uh, pests from coming. And then um, you and its property is similar to benzene, but um, yet it's quite different. So we are not going to um, go into um, reactivity of uh, arenes beyond benzene. You'll notice that most of the focus of uh, this chapter is actually on the reactivity of uh, benzene itself, or even derivative of benzene, for example, methyl benzene. Yeah, anything beyond that, um, we won't discuss for, for the purpose of um, the H2 curriculum, uh, because we don't want to bother you with too much details. Of course, if you are interested in them, you can read um, more about their re reactivity, for example, naphthalene or even anthracin. Yeah, so they show uh, very uh, different properties. In fact, they are actually quite different from uh, benzene when they react with uh, electrophile. Yeah, so uh, that's why we tend not to generalize them um, when we discuss their, their reactivity. So uh, do not be worried about like uh, if we test these questions, um, you know, in exams, um, whether we will just throw you into the deep end, uh, we wouldn't. We will give you some guides as to uh, how to handle them. So um, you do not be, you do not need to be too worried. Okay. So there are other uh, compounds, largely uh, pharmaceutical based compounds, which also contains a phenol ring. So for example, the hormones estron. So you have a phenol ring here, okay, and then uh, you have morphine, you have a 
fan ring over here as well. Okay, and then of course you have uh, fan and learning, which is one of the uh, amino acids. So you have a fan ring here. And then you have uh, tyrosine. Okay, so tyrosine is also another amino acid. Okay. Um, for the case of tyrosine, it is what we call a, a benzene derivative. So, in this case, uh, we look at the unit over here as a whole. So, um, we'll say that tyrosine contains a phenol. Okay, so later on, you will learn that uh, if you have a benzene ring with one of the H substituted with an OH, yeah, we will call this particular functional group a phenol. And uh, phenol tends to be highly reactive, highly susceptible to electrophilic substitution, which you're going to learn later on. <clears throat> okay, um, moving on, you will notice that tryptophan also has a benzene ring over here. Okay, yeah, so uh, you will have a, uh, we, we will call it a phenol ring as well. Uh, however, for tryptophan, right, it is a little bit unique, um, different from um, other aromatic system because its aromaticity actually extended to include uh, this particular uh, five-membered ring. Okay, so we call it an indoor. So, uh, but again, these are not in your H2 curriculum, so you do not need to be too worried about them. Um, um, and if you do encounter them in exams, um, we will guide you accordingly. Okay. So I'm going to move on to the nomenclature uh, portion. Yeah, I think I've mentioned a little bit. So you have benzene, C6H6. Substituted ones, um, usually you put um, their substituent pattern, um, the substituent as the prefix. So uh, you these are some of, the, some of those which you need to be familiar with, like bromobenzene, nitrobenzene, methylbenzene, and hexobenzene. Uh, Okay, to be more exact, this should be called n hexyl benzene because it's a strict chain. Yeah, because um, the hexyl side chain uh, can have branched, can have multiple branching. So, uh, yeah, but in general, uh, I think for the purpose of H2, it is perfectly fine just to call it um, hexyl benzene. Okay, and I, uh, yeah, I've introduced you to phenol earlier on. So, phenol is where one of the H is being replaced by OH. And then uh, benzaldehyde, you saw earlier on as well, one of the H is re replaced by an aldehyde. And then one of H replaced by a carboxylic acid, we call that benzoic acid. And then, of course, the uh, salt of the benzoic acid is called benzoic. Okay, so which includes the sodium cation. All right, then uh, moving on. Okay, so yeah, so over here, they, they, they try to discuss with you um, how to name... Um, the system if let's say uh, benzene the phenol ring is part of the branched yeah so in this case um, we will call this um, two phenol hexane so that means that your 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 hydrocarbon is the hexane and then at the second position is bonded um, to a phenol ring okay uh, this compound can also have an alternative name but uh, I don't think I want to go into details which means uh, you can call it something benzene uh, which is actually based on your side chain yeah but it's not necessary for for you guys to be uh, familiar with it lah. yeah so uh, again if it's ever tested you will be quite straightforward okay so uh, next we have phenol in um, as you might see uh, you have a phenol ring here with uh, where one of the H of ethene is being replaced uh, by the phenol ring yes uh, phenol ethene is uh, quite important uh, in the industry because um, it is used for polymerization so it is actually um, the shock I mean it is actually the proper name of a common name known as styrene okay so you guys can google uh, what is styrene and then you realize that it's actually phenol ethene okay and of course um, I can try phenol uh, methane okay yep and for multiple substituted uh, benzene ring again we will number it based on the smallest uh, numbering so we'll call this uh, one methyl benzene instead of one six dimethyl benzene okay okay but pardon it's one one two dimethyl benzene instead of one six uh, dimethyl benzene okay so of course there are some um, uh, priorities uh, given to the group uh, but I wouldn't uh, want to bother you with the details yeah so uh, in general uh, if you need to need if you need to uh, remember them then you can go and um, look at the relevant uh, page in the introductory organic uh, 
uh, chemistry chapter. Yeah, but in, in general, uh, carboxylic acetics precedence over OH and then methyl group and then um, halogens and uh, nitro group. Yeah, so uh, that's why this compound is known as 2 nitro uh, benzene instead instead of um, something like 2-bromo uh, nitrobenzene, yeah, something along those lines. And next, we have uh, exercise 1.1, where uh, you're supposed to draw the structure of each of the following compounds. Yeah, you notice that it is always easier to uh, draw the structure from the name rather than from the structure naming it. Yeah, and uh, usually this is the requirement for H2, la, okay, to draw the structure from the name. Okay, so uh, you are given 4-bromo-2-nitro-methylbenzene. So I think from here it's quite obvious that methylbenzene is actually the parent. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to draw out methylbenzene. So you have a CH3, okay, at the first position. So normally the, the first position uh, of the substituent, we will name it as... Um, the carbon number one. It will take on carbon number one, and then two, three, uh, four, and then five and six. Okay, and then now we put in the substituent. So the second position is the nitro group, and then the fourth position is the bromo group. Okay, and that's uh, how how we name it as uh, two. Uh, sorry, four bromo two nitro methyl benzene. Okay, and then the next compound, um, um, the parents is actually um pentane okay so this pentane okay so pentane we have a straight chain one two three four five okay so uh let's number it one two three four uh five okay so at the second position we have a phenol ring so uh this will be the second position and then at the third position we have, we have a methyl methyl group yeah so we call this uh three methyl two phenol pentane Okay, you might also be interested uh, to know a little bit about the, the older naming system um, because sometimes in um, older textbooks or older questions, you will encounter them. And then, of course, um, I'm going to uh, bring you to focus on the second position, the third position, and the fourth position. Okay, yeah. So, in general, uh, if, a, if a group attached to the benzene ring, right, is... Uh, second position relative to the first position, we will call this particular group ortho. Yeah, it's just some old naming system which you, you might want to be familiar with because sometimes when you see them, um, it gets a bit confusing. Yeah. Uh, third position, we call it meta. Okay. Fourth position, we call it para. Yeah. So sometimes you will hear uh, maybe the older generation of teachers instead of saying that um, the methyl group being an electron donating group is too far directing, you will hear them saying that it's ortho para directing. Yeah, so that's the reason. Yeah, and you can also name this particular carbon uh, as the ortho carbon and then the meta carbon and the para carbon. Okay, and you might also be interested to know that this particular uh, carbon over here, right, uh, it has a, a special name, we call it ipso. Okay, it's just something for you to know. I mean, you, you don't really need to remember them, but it's good to know. Okay, yeah. So we move on to uh, physical properties. Again, um, you have to invoke your knowledge on chemical bonding in order to have a good understanding of the physical properties and, of course, the use of uh, uh, benzene. Okay, so, of course, uh, first and foremost, um, benzene's colorless. Um, so meaning... Um, it, it, it looks like water, but except with a very strong smell, very strong kerosene smell. Uh, it's toxic and carcinogenic. The toxicity and carcinogenicity, right, we will not discuss here. Uh, you can read about them if you want. And it's interesting that um, when um, uh, benzene is substituted with a methyl group, uh, and that's methyl benzene, right, its carcinogenicity reduces drastically close to 100 times. Yeah, so uh, you might also want to go and find out why. <laughs> okay, so the main intermolecular forces of attraction would be uh, dispersion forces or otherwise what we call it instantaneous dipole-induced dipole interaction. Yeah, so uh, being having a relatively large uh, relative uh, molecular mass uh, give it a relatively high boiling point. You notice that it boils at about 80 degrees Celsius, which is very close to that of uh, ethanol. So for ethanol, right, 
despite having only two carbon, it boils at about 78 degrees Celsius. Yeah, so so you can see that sometimes it's a misconception for students to think that um, dispersion forces is actually weaker than hydrogen bonding. That's not true. It really depends on um, the relative molecular mass as well because um, the larger your relative, the mo relative molecular mass of the molecule, right, um, the more polarizable will be the electron clock and therefore um, the higher will be the probability in them uh, forming uh, strong dispersion forces. Okay, so um, similar to other hydrocarbon, them being um, non-polar, right? So they are actually quite uh, insoluble in uh, polar solvents such as water and um, um, maybe um, uh, ethanol, not, not so soluble, not as soluble in ethanol or methanol. Yeah, but it is highly soluble in solvents such as uh, hexane and uh, tetrachloromethane. Okay, so uh, usually benzene is being used as a solvent, but uh, uh, sometimes because of its uh, uh, toxicity, um, it's not being um, used so frequently nowadays. Lah. Yeah, and uh, of course benzene is also, uh, sub I mean, if you subject benzene to the relevant condition, it can undergo electrophilic uh, substitution. So when you use it as a solvent, you also need to uh, be aware that um, the, the, the system do not have strong electrophile where uh, the benzene can react. Because if you use benzene as a solvent, of course, the idea is that the solvent itself does not take part in the reaction. Yeah, but if it does take part in the reaction, then um, uh, its use as a solvent will be questionable. Okay, yeah. So of course, um, because physical properties is all about uh, discussing uh, about the relative strength of the intermolecular fossil attraction, so we cannot run away from an exercise like 2.1, where um, you are asked to explain the difference in the boiling point of phenol, which actually is 100 degrees Celsius higher, uh, compared to that of uh, the benzene. Uh, this is quite easy to explain, to be honest, because um, if you just take note of the difference between the two, right, um, in addition to having a phenol ring, and in the case of benzene, a benzene ring, right? Um, phenol also has an OH group, which is capable of forming hydrogen bonding. So in that case, when you are discussing the difference in the boiling point, you have to go back to the fundamentals in uh, talking about the fact that uh, both of them exist as simple discrete molecules. However, for phenol, uh, the intermolecular force of attractions between uh, phenol molecules is um, hydrogen bonding on top of uh, dispersion forces, which is also present between um, benzene molecules. So you would expect uh, more energy to overcome the stronger uh, hydrogen bonding uh, present in phenol, uh, which explains why it has a higher uh, bonding point. So you need to be able to phrase your answer in that manner. Uh, the next part on explain in terms of intermolecular forces of attraction and energy why benzene is insoluble in water, then um, again, of course, the, the main idea is talking about uh, solute solvent interactions. Okay, solute solvent uh, interaction uh, versus uh, solvent solvent interaction and uh, solute. Uh, solute interactions. Okay, so the solvent-solvent interaction here we are talking about is actually hydrogen bonding, and then the solute-solute interaction here we are talking about is actually dispersion forces. So this is H bonding, then this is dispersion, and then of course the solute-solvent interaction here is also largely uh, 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 dispersion, if you want to put it um, in a I mean, I mean, I mean, in a very generic way. Like. Yeah. So, of course, um, when, when um, I mean, if you want to be a little bit more specific, then maybe if you use water, then maybe water has actually a permanent dipole, so you can call it a, a permanent dipole-induced dipole interaction. If you want to call it, that's fine, but you can also call it dispersion forces. So, you wouldn't expect this um, to be any, any much higher than the hydrogen bonding which exists between water molecules. Yeah, so because of that, I, 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 I would not expect benzene and water to mix appreciably. Yes, yeah, so in that case, uh, uh, benzene would be, um, in, in, I mean, in our words, relatively insoluble in water. Okay, yeah. So um, 
going into the chemistry here, we 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 are looking at uh, benzene. Okay, so uh, looking at the structure. So if you look at benzene uh, as a molecule itself, it's perfectly flat. So each of the carbon is actually trigonal planar in geometry, and uh, it's actually sp two hybridized. Yeah. So it's being sp two hybridized, right? It will have a unhybridized p orbital, which I shared in green over here. Yeah. So the unhybridized p orbital will overlap side on with the remaining uh five carbon. Um. Of course, if you if you look at the phenol ring, I mean the benzene ring, uh itself like this so if i number the carbon as one two three four five six yeah so uh if i have a uh unhybridized p orbital here you would expect it to overlap side on with either the one um, next to it which is carbon two or carbon six yeah so if you if you solely focus on a localized uh model then um you would ex i mean i mean if you choose to overlap with carbon number six uh, then of course five will overlap with four and then two will overlap with three. However, right, who is to say that uh one and two cannot overlap? Yeah, so in that case, um if you if you look at it from another angle, then actually one and two can overlap, three and four can overlap, and then five and six can overlap. Yeah. But this will actually sort of uh make the system very restricted because uh since they are already in the fixed in the ring position, so nothing is actually stopping um, one for overlapping with six, two for overlapping with three, and then four for overlapping with five. And that's why um, for the benzene ring, right, each of the unhybridized p orbital will form a continuous uh, overlap with the remaining uh, p orbital, and uh, that's what gives uh, it the ring current, which I, of course we're not going to discuss in H2. Yeah, but uh, this uh, continuous overlap actually gives um, the benzene a very special property and uh, this also makes it uh, extremely stable, okay, as compared to uh, other systems, uh, in that case, other alkenes. Lah. So although benzene undergoes electro, I mean, it's electron-rich uh, on itself, uh, it, it would not prefer to undergo an addition reaction, okay, it prefers to undergo a substitution reaction, because a substitution reaction allows it to retain its aromaticity. Yeah, so uh, that might be something which um, you might also want to be familiar with. Okay, and then uh, what I have described um, to, to you earlier on, right, it's sort of uh, shown on in page 8, yeah, regarding the cycle overlap. Yeah, so in, so in general, um, because of the continuous overlap, um, you will actually be getting two ring currents, okay, over here and one on top and one below. So this continuous overlap uh, actually caused the benzene ring to be electron-rich both on top and below. Yeah, so when the electrophile actually approaches the benzene ring, right, it doesn't approach from this particular side. Rather, it approaches from somewhere from the top, yeah. So this actually allows um, the electrophile to interact well with the ring currents or with the overlapping pi electron clocks. Okay, yeah. So um, the implication of this, which is what otherwise what we call a delocalized model, is that uh, each of the carbon-carbon bond in benzene is of the same uh, length. Uh, you can view it based on sim symmetry reasoning, perfectly symmetrical, or you can... Um, uh, look at it uh, based on the fact that because each of the carbon uh, will have a partial single bond and a partial double bond character, so on the average, its bond length will be about 1.5 times that of a single bond, or the bond energy will be about 1.5 times that of a single bond. Yeah, So it doesn't have a full double bond and it doesn't have a full single bond. You can view it um, from that particular angle if it um, makes you feel a little bit better. Yeah. So in terms of uh, representation using resonance structure. Um, we'll have a benzene ring here with three double bonds, and then uh, we'll put a resonance arrow, okay, um, and then uh, we will show the push in electron density from one pi bond to the next, okay, and then uh, we get something like this. And because um, they are indistinguishable, yeah, so a better representation a better representation, right, is actually drawing the benzene ring 
with a delocalized electron cloud represented by a dot dotted line like this. Okay, yeah. However, when we draw it with a dotted line, it takes too much, uh, I mean, too long a time, so it's not efficient. So uh, in general, we represent benzene ring with just a ring inside the hexagon. Yeah, so when we draw a ring inside, we are actually representing um, a benzene ring or a phenol ring. So uh, that's something which you might want to be familiar with. Okay, yeah. And then uh, I think what we discussed earlier on is represented here. So the CC single bond is about 350 kilojoules per mole. Uh, double bond is about 610. Yeah, so uh, the CC bond in benzene, every single CC bond is uh, 520 kilojoules per mole. It's every single one. Not just one of them. Okay, so remember this. It's every single one. Yeah, because of the delocalized model which um, we are uh, discussing about. Yeah, so the difference in reactivity between alkenes and benzene, right, is that uh, benzene, as I mentioned earlier on, it tends to undergo a substitution reaction rather than an addition reaction. Yeah, the reason is because an addition reaction will cause the aromaticity of the benzene, right, um, to be destructed. Uh, in, that, in, in, in this sense, to be destroyed. Yeah, so uh, I think I've introduced this new term here, aromaticity, which uh, I think uh, is not kind of being introduced earlier on. Okay, so um, this particular delocalization, right, uh, which I kind of mentioned here with six pi electron club. Okay, because each of the carbon contribute one electron, so we will call this the six pi uh, electron system, right? Um, so any any cyclic system with six pi electron, uh, we will call it an aromatic system. Okay, so uh, that means that this particular system uh, has some uh, uh, special um, uh, stability or exceptional stability. Yeah, so you might want to uh, take note of this term because the aromatic system and the so-called delocalized system tends to be used interchangeably, but aromatic has a has a very special and deep meaning in chemistry. Lah. Yeah, because in general, for a system to be aromatic, it needs to fulfill some, some rules, which we call it the Huckel's rule. Yeah, but Huckel's rule, again, in this case, is not um, taught to you in H2, so uh, I don't want to go into details. Yeah, but basically, if you want to decide if an aromatic system or if it's a ring system containing um, uh, empty, or rather con containing unhabitized P orbital, whether it, it is possible to fulfill the, the aromatic behavior, yeah, we will count the number of electrons to check whether it has 4n plus 2 electrons. So n is actually an integer. Yeah, so in this case, for benzene, it fulfills the 4n plus, plus 2 rules because uh, for, for benzene, n is actually equals to 1. Yeah, okay, so I, I, it's just a very uh, slip slop introduction to the Huckel's rule. I, I hope it doesn't confuse you too much, and um, uh, that's why there's a, there's a new term being introduced here, so I thought I just want to explain what, what is the meaning of aromaticity. Yeah, so in general, benzene tends to undergo electrophilic substitution as opposed to uh, electrophilic addition. Okay, so electrophilic addition uh, tends to be reserved for alkenes. Okay, of course there are exceptions. I mean, we're not saying that it is impossible for one, I mean, for benzene to undergo electrophilic addition. But if you look at a pure benzene, then yeah, uh, generally not possible. Yeah, but of course, um, if it's substituted with some interesting reagents, I mean, not reagents, uh, interesting groups, then maybe you expect the reactivity to be Quite different. Okay, so uh, and and I think we focus on the fact that benzene undergoes only um, elect with I mean reactions with electrophiles, right? But uh, it's not true. I mean, benzene can react with nucleophiles in exceptional cases. Yeah, so it's not like uh, only it can react with electrophiles. Yeah, so uh, I think a general rule in chemistry is that do not be uh, so fixated uh, by 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 just. I mean, I'm by the system where um, you think that it's either black or white, yeah. So it's not a, it's not a, it's not a system where um, uh, it can only undergo reaction with electrophile and not nucleophile. Yeah, it is a continuum. Yeah. Okay, so it's not a binary system. Uh, so it's not zero or one. It can be um, somewhere in between. Yeah. So I think um, uh, I mean sometimes the drawback of explaining things, I think in the notes setting is that we 
the students tend to have the impression that everything is、uh, black and white, but it's not true. Yeah, it's just that when we are introducing you some of these concepts, we we tend to、um, showcase to you、um, what happened for this particular system without any other external interference. Yeah, so of course, if there are interference,、uh, then we can have. More kinds of、uh, potential reaction taking place, okay. But when you learn something, it is important that you learn it. I mean, you learn it、um, from the fundamental principle first, and then、um, any additional knowledge is for you to keep, of course. Okay, so yeah, so we have an example here. So for example,、um, on the left,、uh, we have an electrophilic addition where、um, the bromine acts across the double bonds, so results in、um, the formation of two sigma bond. And the、uh, breaking of one pi and one sigma bond. Okay, but for the for the reaction of benzene with bromine, you notice that the condition is a little bit different. Okay, so the condition is that um, I need a Lewis acid here, or what we call the halogen carrier, and uh to be introduced together with bromine. Yeah. So actually, these two right, if you learn later on, is actually to generate the electrophile. Yeah. So uh maybe I can write it above. So um the FeBr three right plus bromine, yeah. So this particular combination is actually to generate the electrophile. So uh you will actually form FeBr four minus plus Br plus, yeah. So Br plus is what we call the electrophile. Yeah. So this particular electrophile. Uh, having a plus charge will then um cause the the benzene ring to undergo、uh, a nucleophilic attack. So your benzene ring will then um attack uh the electrophile to generate an unstable carbocationic intermediate. Yeah, and then instead of um another bromine coming in, in so instead of another bromine coming in um to give you something like this and this, right? Yeah, because if it undergoes an addition reaction. Sorry, let me redraw this.、Huh? So if benzene undergoes a react an addition reaction, right? What you get is actually something like this: a Br and a Br. But you notice that the phenol ring loses its aromaticity. Yeah, because it no longer has six pi electrons. So the focus here is my aromatic system must have six pi electrons in order to be qualified as aromatic system. Uh, for the case of a six membered ring, lah. So in this case. Uh, is no longer aromatic, so therefore its stability is greatly reduced. Yeah. So uh, if you if you heard me from day one, um,、uh, in general chemistry, when reactants react, they want to generate a a system where, um, the the molecules is as stable as they can. Yeah. They want to reduce their electronic energy. So um, yeah. So they all seek stability, and they seek stability by giving up energy. Uh, in the form of heat. Or、uh, for photocatalytic reaction in the form of light. Okay, so um, yeah. So in this case, uh, for the case of electrophilic substitution, a H is lost as a H plus, and uh, later on you're going to learn the mechanism, and and this will result in the uh restoration of the aromatic ring lah. Okay, so for an application example, which um although it's being put as something like a additional knowledge, ah,、uh, actually uh you will have gone through this. Uh, in energetics, or you would have gone through this, uh, in energetics in maybe one of your tutorial question. So, uh, uh, it's just something that we want to brought forward to maybe explain some of these things to you. Okay. So, uh, uh, so without going into explaining all this, I'll, I'll just go straight into the energy, uh, level diagram. Yeah. So, uh, in short, for for the case of cyclohexene, the enthalpy change of hydrogenation is actually. Uh, one minus one one eight kilojoules per mole. So that actually means that um when um a C C double bond in the case of cyclohexene undergoes a hydrogenation reaction, it releases uh negative, or rather it releases hundred eighteen kilojoules of energy per mole of cyclohexene. Yeah, if we have two isolated double bond in cyclohexyl one four diene. And then、um, the amount of energy released will be double, which makes sense, or almost, or rather almost double, lah. Which makes sense because、um, you are just taking one one eight, kind of sort of multiply by two, lah. So it's about two three six. Of course, the actual is two three two. There will be some difference, so it will not be exactly multiply by two, but 
the difference is maybe within a, a two to three percent error lah, so that's fine okay so a hypothetical um benzene ring in this case uh what we call uh, cyclohexatriene you would expect it to be about 354 kilojoules per mole so that will be 118 multiplied by 3 okay so that will be 354 kilojoules per mole okay however the actual fact is that for for benzene right its enthalpy change of hydrogenation is actually just minus 205 kilojoules per mole of benzene yeah so there is sort of like a loss of uh, 149 kilojoules per mole so there's a difference in uh, energy of 149 kilojoules per mole between uh, the hypothetical cyclohexa triene and the actual benzene ring so the difference we call it uh, the resonance stabilization energy or i think in short we call it the resonance energy okay so i think this term is mentioned here the stabilization or 149 kilojoules per mole is known as resonance uh, sorry uh, stabilization energy uh delocalization energy or resonance energy yeah okay so some textbook will call it the resonance stabilization energy yeah so however you call it you know what it means like, which means it is the additional stabilization due to the delocalized uh, electron clock in the benzene ring okay so um we have a uh, exercise 3.1 over here yeah so for exercise 3.1 i think um, we'll just do it um, parts by part so for part a right the uh, consider cyclohexane cyclohexene and uh, methylbenzene yeah so is methylbenzene the only compound that contains sp2 hybridized uh, carbon atoms so of course uh, the answer is no lah, because for for methyl so i think first of all we need to draw all the all the three structures so cyclohexane is like that although we draw cyclohexane as flex but we know that each of the carbon uh, in addition um, to forming two single bonds with um, the other two carbon right it also has two sigma bond with h so uh, each of the carbon in cyclohexane is actually sp3 hybridized okay however for cyclohexane right um, one of the cc bond contains a pi bond yeah so of course, uh, for cyclohexene, I expect two sp2 hybridized carbon. Okay, so these two are sp2 hybridized carbon. Um, the rest, which I'm going to highlight in purple, are actually sp3 hybridized. Yeah, so of course, uh, for cyclohexene, all these are sp3 hybridized. Okay, yep. And then um, moving on to, to, to the benzene ring, um, for methyl benzene, I have a CH3. And then, of course, I have a benzene ring over here. So each of the carbon here is actually sp2. So all together, we have six sp2 hybridized carbon. Uh, it is easy to remember if you know that for benzene ring, for uh, it must be aromatic. And for it to be aromatic, there must be six pi electrons. So uh, who or what contribute the six pi electrons? So each of the carbon will contribute one. And for each carbon to contribute once, uh, that means that uh, each of the carbon must have one unhybridized uh, p orbital. Yeah, I think that will be easier for you to understand. Um, why is it that uh, for benzene ring, uh, all the carbons are sp two hybridized except, of course, the the the, the CH three Okay, so the CH three here is actually sp three. Okay, the one at least um I'm I'm using the similar notation. Uh highlighting in purple for sp3 hybridized carbons okay okay so 3.1b um, which property does benzene have as a consequence of the delocalized electrons uh, present in the molecule okay so um, we need to pick the options and of course here we need to decide uh, which is the best options um, amongst uh, the rest to be picked remember mcq when we pick option we choose the best option Ah, the best option need not be 100% correct. Yeah, so basically just the best option within that category. Okay, is it a good electrical conductor? Some of you might be thinking that because it has a delocalized electron cloud, it's a good electrical conductor. But uh, do not be fooled by this because remember that if I give you a solution of benzene, it basically contains benzene uh, molecules uh, moving around um, very fast and interacting with each other via... Uh, weak dispersion forces so the pi electron clouds okay the delocalized pi electron cloud happen within each of the benzene yeah so 
the pi electron cloud will not be able to delocalize from one benzene to the next benzene ring. Yeah, I think you need to be aware of that. So therefore, for electrical conductivity, it is not the case. Yeah, if you are simply talking about a solution of benzene. Uh, of course, it is possible for you to turn um, uh, benzene into a lightly electrical conductor. So that is what we call conducting polymers. But you have to polymerize benzene first, but not just polymerize benzene. You have to ensure that your benzene molecules is rigid. Yeah, it, you, need, you need the benzene to be rigid so that the pi electron clock can form a continuous overlap from one end to the other end. Yeah, if you allow it to have free bond rotation, then uh, again, electrical conductivity will be poor. So whatever the case is, it is not a good electrical conductor for just a, a, a benzene, uh, I mean, for a solution of benzene. Okay, is it susceptible to uh, attack by nucleophilic reagents? Uh, again, let us focus on what they are asking us. They are asking us about benzene, not substituted benzene, uh, just benzene itself. So definitely this is no. Okay, definitely not susceptible to nucleophilic attack. Definitely will be susceptible to electrophilic attack if you're just talking about benzene itself. Okay, how about addition reaction of benzene take place more readily and substitution? I think earlier on we have talked about that. No. Okay, they prefer substitution. Okay, in order to restore or retain uh, its aromaticity. Okay, so substitution reaction is preferred. And carbon-carbon um, length, bond length is between that of a CC single and a CC double bond. This is definitely correct. Okay, I think we have discussed that earlier on. Okay, yep. Um, for naphthalene, it's an aromatic compound uh, with the following structure. Yeah, so question is, um, how many pi electron does naphthalene have? So, okay, so if you, if you just do a quick count, um, the formula is actually C six H uh one two three four H eight. Okay, so there are eight H's here. Uh, which if you wish to, you can write them down. Okay, I think it's quite important to recognize that. Yeah, sorry, not C six. Um, C ten. So there are ten uh, hydrogen. C ten H eight. Yeah. So in general. Remember, we said earlier on, um, 10 carbons here, right? So these 10 carbons, uh, each carbon is sp2 hybridized uh, carbon. Okay, so each carbon is sp2 hybridized. So each of the carbon, right, contributes um, one pi electron. Okay, or you can say that each carbon contains one I have sp orbital. So all together, the total number of pi electrons will be 10 times 1. So that will be 10 pi electrons. Okay, so I hope um, uh, this is the way to do it. Uh, it's not too difficult in that sense. Okay, so is naphthalene a planar molecule? Yeah, it has to be planar. Uh, no choice. It can't have bond rotation. The reason is because each of the carbon here is sp2 hybridized. So if you, if you put each of the carbon sp2 hybridized together and in order to form the continuous pi electron, uh, the p uh, electron clock, or rather the p orbital in each carbon, will form a uh, side on overlap with the rest of the uh, carbon. So, in, in that case, it has to be effectively planar in order for the overlap to take place appreciably. Okay, so, um, so yes, definitely planar because each carbon is sp2 uh, hybridized, and um, the unhybridized p orbital will be able to overlap. Uh, continuously with the rest of the pi system. Okay, and then of course, uh, draw all the hydro atoms on naphthalene. I think I've just drew, drawn it. Okay, so it's over here. So these are um, all the eight um, hydrogens you can have. Okay, yep. So I'm going to move on to the next part. Okay, which is um, on the reaction of uh, benzene. Okay, so in general, benzene... Uh, actually undergoes um, electrophilic substitution, which I think we have um, been talking about uh, quite a bit of it, or made mention about it earlier on. Okay, yeah, so so yes, so in general, I have a benzene ring over on the left-hand side, okay? Uh, we deliberately drew the H here so that you know that um, the H is being replaced by the electrophile, okay? 
Yeah, so this is a generic reaction. So the electrophile could be uh, Br+, plus, NO2+, plus, R+, plus, or, or, or any other related uh, electrophiles. Okay, the general mechanism, uh, you might want to take note of it, okay, is that the first step, uh, okay, so you need to draw the benzene, you, you need to draw the benzene ring with a ring, and then the first step actually involves um, the pi electron clouds, okay, uh, a pair of electrons, in fact, from the pi electron cloud, uh, approaching the electrophile. So generally we'll draw like this, approaching the electrophile, okay, with a full arrow, and then um, the slow step, okay, it's the slow step because the aromaticity is being disrupted, and then it leads to the formation of a carbocation. Okay, so that's why um, um, normally we will call the first step the slow step because uh, if aromaticity is disrupted and you're forming an unstable carbocation, you would expect a relatively high activation barrier uh, to, to, to take, I mean, to require for the reaction to take place. Okay, and then um, you notice this semi-crescent. Okay, so this particular semi-crescent, right, is actually trying to tell you that the delocalized electron clouds happen between these five carbons over here. These are the five carbons. Only these five carbons. Okay, so the carbocal in the media, right, in this case, right, it will have five sp2 hybridized carbon. Okay, but the ipso carbon, I hope you remember what does ipso mean, this carbon, okay, will be sp3. Okay, yeah, so in this sense, sometimes the students get a bit confused, so I will try to explain a little bit more over here. Okay, so uh, if I'm going to look at it this way, right, uh, benzene as having um, three double bonds, okay, which normally we will do that um, at university like, because it's actually easier to draw a mechanism like this. Like. But of course, for well, H2Ys, we recommend drawing it as a ring system. But um, whatever I'm going to illustrate here, I think it will help you in your understanding. Yeah. So when we draw a mechanism, right, so we have a, a electrophile here. Okay. So in this case, we will allow the one of the pi bond, I think it's easier to understand, approaching the electrophile. Okay. And then in the process, um, I will generate this particular carbocation. Okay, so this carbocation, right, the other two remain intact. So uh, the E is over here. So that's the substituent. Okay, and then, um, then there will be a plus charge over here. So there's a plus charge. Okay, there's a plus charge over here. Okay, how do you know that there's a plus charge over there? Okay, um, so this is the part that sometimes students cannot see. So uh, maybe I will, I will zoom further. So if I zoom further, I think it's easier. So uh, let me just annotate the, the H's. So I annotate this H in green. And then maybe the other H maybe in orange. Okay, so you notice that when the electrophile is being added to uh, this particular carbon containing the green H, right? The H is still there, and of course the other carbon, the H is okay. So maybe I should erase this first. Okay, so for the other carbon, right? Actually, the H is still here. Okay, so I hope um this is a little bit clearer. Yeah. So uh so if you count it like that, it's like this benzene ring undergoes sort of like a, initially it's an addition reaction first because the pi bond um a pair of electrons form the new sigma bond, which is this part. So this is the new sigma bond being formed. So this is the new sigma bond being formed. And then um, the adjacent carbon become the carbocation. Yeah. So you notice that from this particular drawing, right, you notice that uh, this is sp2 hybridized. This sp2, 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 right? So there will be a continuous electron cloud being formed like this. Yeah. And this continuous electron cloud, right, uh, in short, right, it is sort of represented by the semi-crescent which you saw earlier on. So, uh, if I'm going to represent it um, with a semi-crescent, then it will be like this, like this. So, with a plus charge over here. And then, of course, I will write in the rest. So, the H is still here. And then, um, the electrophile. And then, of course, the H is still here. Yeah. Okay. Then, of course, uh, later on, if I just... Um, move on a, a little bit further, right? The first step, which is the final step, right, actually involved 
um, actually involve the one of the bronze third base up, um, abstracting the H and then um, this CH sigma bond now breaks and then um, the electron density between the carbon and the H goes back into the benzene ring and aromaticity is now being restored. Okay, so um, using this similar example, um, I'm going to continue from here so that's easier. Okay, so um, using the same example, I will have a bronsted base, okay, uh, which can be from elsewhere, and then I will grab this H over here, and then uh, this bond will now break inside, and then um, the aromaticity will now be destroyed. I mean, will now be restored. Okay, yeah. So I can I can use the same idea over here. So uh, if I use the same idea, then you notice that um. I grab the H, and then this CH sigma bond, right? Uh, electron density flows in to reform the pi bond and to reconstruct, so called. I mean, it's not really construct, but yeah, to restore the aromaticity. Yeah. So uh, I'm just showing you from different viewpoints so that I think uh, in terms of learning, it's easier. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think there are two reasons why I I went a little bit into details uh, because I need I need you guys to understand why the delocalized electron cloud in the intermediate is represented with a semi-crescent and it's only between the five carbon and not all the way. Yeah, so uh, in that case, what I'm going to say is that, <coughs> excuse me, if you, if you show your intermediate like this, let's say you show it like this, you anyhow like this, okay, I guarantee you that you'll be marked wrong. Okay, guarantee. Okay, you have to be very careful here when you show the delocalization in your intermediate. Okay, it's only between these five carbon. Okay, and of course, is the intermediate flat? So the answer is no, it's not flat. Because remember, we have a sp3 hybridized carbon here. So, um, so the intermediate actually looks like this. Okay, so we have, um, so I'm just going to draw it in the empty space over here. It's like this. Okay, so it's not a very nice 3D drawing, which I'm going to attempt. Okay, like this. And then um, sp2 hybridized carbon. S sorry, sp3 hybridized carbon. Okay, and then um, just going to show in color, so it's easier. So, so the H is here. Okay, and then um, the H. Oh, sorry, the H I should be drawing in green. Okay, so... Sorry about that. Uh, okay, so the H is here. Okay, then the electrophile is here. So I'm just going to be consistent with my um, color coding. And then, um, uh, of course, uh, for the other carbon, uh, remember there's an orange H over here. Yeah, so the orange H, I'm just going to try to, to draw it a little bit trigonal planar, although it doesn't look very trigonal uh, planar here. Okay, and then uh, I'm going to just show you the the rest of the P orbitals, which looks like this. Like. Yeah, so I hope you can uh, now tell from here. And then um, where is the positively charged carbon cation? So it's actually here. Yeah, so actually this P orbital is empty. Okay, so maybe I represent with a different one. Okay, so uh, I'll just draw in purple. Yeah, so this carbocation is empty. The, uh, or rather, it has an empty P orbital. Okay, and then the rest of the carbon, right? You have uh, electrons. Yeah, so the total number of delocalized electrons in the intermediate is actually 4 pi electrons. Okay, remember, uh, not remember this, but try to deduce this on your own. Okay, it's actually four pi electrons and not five, and definitely not six, and not three, of course. Yeah, so it's only four pi electrons. It is important for you guys to understand um, quite in detail what exactly I've just said for the past 10 minutes. Um, although I may have uh, gone a little bit into details and then some of the way I explain may not, may not really come up... Um, very clearly, um, or rather, it may not be explained in the same way as some of the textbooks or even the notes. Yeah, but uh, all these are little points which I thought you should take note of. Like, yeah, so 
after you understood what I've just said and uh, when you read through the notes, it will be a lot easier. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so and then after that is the next, uh, which is the fast step, which I don't think I need to go into uh, uh, details, okay? Because in the fast step, I think um, we, can easily under, we can easily understand it from um, this particular 3D drawing I have, like, because in the fast step, what exactly is happening is that um, the bronze step base, okay, will then grab this particular proton, and then this particular CH sigma bond, right, okay, will then uh, form back over here. So uh, in that sense, um, this carbon will be rehybridized back to sp2 hybridized, and then a new uh, pi system will be formed between this carbon and over here. So in that sense, um, the aromaticity is now, um, I mean, reconstructed, so called, or restocked, if you want to put it um, in a more accurate manner. Okay, yeah, so uh, I've explained, and of course it's a fast step, because it's the fast step because uh, we are expecting um, it to be near nearly barrelless since aromaticity is being um, restocked. Okay, and of course a lot of details are being uh, discussed over here. Uh, regarding the sp2 hybridized um, shit all this I think I've just gone into details earlier on so I don't think I'm I'm, I'm going to discuss a lot over here because um, uh, whatever things you might not have understood from this particular portion you can always look back at uh, what I've drawn above and then try to figure out what exactly is going on which is very important because um, the students tend to be a little bit confused okay for 4.2, right, we have electrophilic substitution um, with chlorine and bromine. Uh, we call it chlorination or uh, bromination. Okay, so uh, it's important for you to, to be aware of the conditions. Okay, so we use chlorine and iron 3 chloride as the Lewis acid. And then uh, uh, for the case of bromination, we use um, iron 3 bromide. Okay, usually we will, we will pair it uh, together with the relevant halogen. So if it's chlorine, we'll use uh, iron 3 chloride. Or we can also use aluminum chloride. Um, for bromination, we'll use uh, the relevant bromide. Okay, yeah. So um, you might also want to uh, take note that for iron, it is not actually the Lewis acid. Okay, but in this case, it's B. Um, it helps to generate the Lewis acid. Okay, so I think it's important uh, not to just call it um, anyhow, okay? Yeah, so, but as it sorts, like iron 3 chloride and 3 bromide, they are called the Lewis acid, okay? But the metal itself is to actually help to generate the Lewis acid, okay? So you can also use aluminium uh, in, in, uh, to replace uh, uh, iron if you wish to. Like. Okay, of course, the... Um, for the mechanism for electrophilic substitution, unlike uh, it's a little bit unlike um, el um, electrophilic addition for alkenes, um, it can be quite similar. Okay, the difficult part here for most of the students, right, for electrophilic substitution, is uh, to recognize the nature of the electrophile, like how to generate the electrophile. Yeah. So uh, for the formation of the electrophile, it's important for you to write them out, although it's not part of the electrophilic substitution mechanism. Because the mechanism uh, usually begins uh, with the benzene ring uh, attacking the electrophile. Yeah, so um, it's something you need to be um, aware of. Okay, so when the benzene ring um, approaches the electrophile, the electrophile should already be generated. Okay, so there isn't a need for you to draw the mechanism for the generation of the electrophile. So um, a balanced equation like this will suffice. Okay, but of course, if you wish to, um, you can um, do it quite simply. So uh, basically, it's just the polarization of the Lewis acid. Okay, so the um, so this particular polarization will lead to um, the the bromine taking on a dipole moment. Okay, and then um, this will take place. So the sigma bond will now break towards iron, and then um, in the process you will generate FeBr um, four minus uh, plus Br plus. Yeah. So that's usually how it's being uh, represented, lah. If you if you wish to, lah. If not, then there is a need for you to draw that. And then the bromine electrophile, okay, will then be attacked by the by the phenol ring, 
and benzene ring and then um yeah so usually we draw from the center of the benzene ring attacking the bromate electrophile uh, remember the carbocationic intermediate uh delocalized among these five only okay so only to draw show it out properly and then usually in the last step um the bronsted base is actually um the tetral bromo ion uh, N ion. So usually we're just drawing a lone pair here. Yeah. But if you want to be um, very exact, right, you could actually just draw it out as FEBR 4 minus. Okay. Something like that. Okay. With a mic. So the iron here actually takes on a negative formal charge. And then um, the FEBR bond is highly polarized. So this is actually the one that attacks the H. Yeah. It's not the lone pair. Yeah, but of course, um, for simplicity, this is okay. So this is okay uh, for simplicity. Okay, but if you want it to be exact, it's actually the FEBR sigma bond uh, approaching the H, uh, and in, in this case, generate HBR. And then, of course, regenerate the Lewis acid catalyst, and then you will form bromobenzene. Okay, yeah. So in the energy profile diagram, you notice that the... Um, um, Activation at the, the first step is actually the activation, uh, uh, or rather the rate determining step. Okay, and then uh, you you generally don't need to draw the generation of the electrophile in your energy profile diagram. Yeah, so this is uh, perfectly fine. And then um, you draw the intermediate and this, and then the second activation barrier is usually quite low, and then um, you generate HBr and the relevant Lewis acids. Okay, you notice that. Um, HBr as a gas is being generated, so the reaction tends to be entropy driven as well. Okay. Okay, so we have a note over here. Uh, yeah. So th these are just some of the details which um um we we, we didn't quite discuss earlier on. So so basically uh we call this the Lewis acid because the the iron at the aluminum center is electron deficient, so they they are able to accept an electron uh, pair. From the relevant halogen and in the process generates the electrophile. So in this case, either bromine electrophile or chlorine electrophile. Yeah. So either way works. Okay. If I do not have a Lewis acid uh catalyst, will the reaction still work? No, it wouldn't work for the case of um benzene. Yeah. If because um the halogen themselves are not as electrophilic as they should be, and of course benzene itself. Uh, does not have the capability of polarizing the electron cloud of the halogen so much so that it can generate its form its its own electrophile. So it's a bit different from electrophilic addition of alkenes, because for electrophilic addition of alkenes, the pi electron cloud of the C double bond right is actually uh strong enough to polarize the bromine molecules so much so that um is able to attack the bromine and uh, form the carbocation, but uh, benzene ring uh, lacks this capability. Yeah, but in, it is not, definitely it's not true that benzene ring um, without other substituent cannot do that. So if benzene ring, uh, one of the H is re uh, replaced by OH, in that case phenol, yeah, so phenol is able to generate its own electrophile. Uh, and in that sense, phenol is definitely um, electron rich enough to undergo electrophilic substitution on its own without the need of a Lewis acid. Yeah, so the situation will change according to the nature of the substituent onto the benzene ring. So you do not need to worry about, I mean, not say not to worry, but you do not, um, uh, so there's no blanket rule, like I definitely must need a Lewis acid in order to generate the electrophile. Yeah, uh, it's definitely a mixed, yeah, depends on the situation. Okay, it is important for you to also recognize that your Lewis acid are also highly uh, susceptible to hydrolysis by water. So therefore, um, for Lewis acid, definitely they must be anhydrous. Lah. So do not uh, have itchy hand and write um, ALCl3 bracket equals. Okay, it must be a solid. Okay, if you cannot remember, just don't write anything. Just put FeCl3. Okay, that will be good enough. Yeah, so sometimes iron and aluminum can be used because they generate the... Um, Sort in C2. So therefore, the metal themselves are not Lewis acids. They are actually uh, undergoing redox reaction with the relevant halogen to generate the uh, Lewis acid in C2. Uh, and then this might be better. Okay. 
Okay, so next we have electrophilic substitution and concentrated nitric acid. So we call this uh, nitration. Okay, so for nitration, right, the condition is not only do we need concentrated nitric acid, but we also need concentrated sulfuric acid. This is the only condition which you need to remember because uh, it pertains specifically to nitro, the formation of nitrobenzene. So I need to maintain the reflux at 55 degrees Celsius. I think I've made, explained to you what is reflux in introductory chapter. Uh, if um, you cannot remember, you might want to take a look again. Yeah, so this is the formation of nitrobenzene as an orange oil. Uh, this is the only condition you might need to remember, at least for the, for the, for the first few chapters. Okay, 55 degrees Celsius. Other than that, temperature-wise, you do not need to memorize. Okay, the concentrated sulfuric acid here actually act as the Lewis acid catalyst here uh, because it will help to generate the nitronium electrophile. So the nitronium electrophile actually looks like this. Yeah. So it helps to generate this particular electrophile uh, through a dehydration reaction. Okay, um, maybe I can just write it out here. So uh, based on what you know in uh, dot and cross diagram, Nitric acid actually looks like this. Yeah. So in the presence of uh, concentrated sulfuric acid, the OH over here will actually be protonated. Okay, so protonated meaning that uh, it will uh, react as a Lewis base to form um, an acid, which looks like this. So it'll be protonated and then um, H2SO4 will then lose a H plus. Yeah. So this particular structure, okay, this particular structure will then lose the water molecule. Okay, so you this water molecule will be lost. Okay, and in the process, I will generate the electrophile. So uh H2O will will, will be produced and then uh, the nitronium electrophile will be generated. So this nitronium electrophile looks like this. You'll notice that this is a little bit different from what I've drawn earlier on, right? So in this case, I draw it this way, but in this case, I draw it linear, right? Okay, because um, what I've drawn here is actually the more stable form of the nitronate electrophile. So this particular electrophile, right, actually, uh, the lone pairs of, one of the lone pairs of electrons, okay, can overlap. And then when you overlap, the, the structure will be more stable. Because in this case, the N only has six electrons. But if it overlaps like this, my N um, will have eight electrons. So this is actually the more stable um, um, species, uh, so, so to say. Lah. I mean, uh, but of course, um, uh, for, for the purpose of H2, uh, it is perfectly okay if you just show your nitronate electrophile like this. Yeah, you don't have to show it this way. Okay, I think it's explained to you later on. Yeah, it's explained to you over here how the nitronate electrophile is being generated. You notice that there isn't a real need for you to draw it out. So if you are not sure, just don't draw it out. Just leave it as NO2+. Plus. Okay, so the the pi electron clock will then attack the nitrogen. Okay, and then um, after that, in the fast step, you will regenerate the uh, so the Lewis acid catalyst, which is of con concentrated sulfuric acid. Yeah. Okay. So this protonation of nitric acid, right, is what we call um, a dehydration. Because after protonation, your nitric acid, the protonated form of nitric acid, will lose a water molecule, and then in the process, generate the nitronate electrophile. So this, the loss of the water molecule, is what we call dehydration. So it's some some sort of like it's forcing nitric acid to lose a water in order to generate an electrophile. Okay, so there was some background information given here, like how do you generate the NO2 plus electrophile? If you are interested, you can read about it. Uh, but I have actually given you the first two steps if you if you noticed. Okay, and then um, yeah, I mean if you wish to, um, you can you can try to figure out how to draw the mechanism using curly arrows. But other than that, you actually do not need to worry so much. Okay, um, without concentrated acid, benzene itself cannot undergo nitration. Okay, so I think um. This is something you need to be aware of. Yeah. Um, and then when it's maintained at 55 degrees Celsius, the first uh, nitrobenzene will be obtained. But if you actually heat it up more rigorously, you, you might get the, the di-substituted nitrobenzene or the tri-substituted tri-nitrobenzene. Uh, tri but it's usually uh, not easy for, for these reactions to take place. Yeah. Uh, the reason being nitro group is deactivating. So a deactivating group 
will make the benzene ring less susceptible to electrophilic substitution. Okay, yeah. Uh, I think the fourth point, nitration of benzene is important to make phenolamine. Okay, so yeah, um, I think it's mentioned here. So this reaction is super important in JC2. So uh, it might be good for you to know now. So nitro benzene uh, uh, can undergo a reduction in the presence of tin in concentrated HCl. And then uh, after that, you need to add uh, sodium hydroxide. You might be wondering why why is that a need to add sodium hydroxide? Okay, so basically in the presence of concentrated sulfuric acid, the system is actually acidic. Yeah, so when it generates phenolamine, right, the phenolamine will be generated as a salt, or meaning the protonated form of phenolamine. So I need the sodium hydroxide, right, uh, to actually remove the H plus in the cold condition. So basically, the last step is actually an acid-base neutralization reaction. Yeah. Okay, so we have an exercise 4.1. Okay, so um, MCQ, which sets of conditions will bring about the transformation shown below? Okay, so um, so we have chlorine in UV, definitely no. This is free radical substitution. So uh, clearly we wanted an electrophilic substitution. Okay, so I think... Um, uh, B is a trick question because take note that it's AQ here. Yeah, so it's a trick question. The students usually will be trick, so be careful. Yeah, um, with iron here is to generate iron 3 chloride in C2. So, yeah, C will be the likely answer. Concentrated HCl heat, no. Okay, we, 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 we don't do chlorination this way. We need the electrophile. Yeah, the concentrated HCl here, the electrophile trophilic sites is actually the H and not the Cl. Okay, so what is the main reason for adding concentrated sulfuric acid to concentrated nitric acid? Okay, so again, uh, I think a short answer earlier on is uh, to, to remove H2O, la, so it's some sort of a dehydration uh, condition. Yeah, so definitely not a solvent, uh, definitely not to remove protons because the role of Concentrated sulfuric acid is to add protons. Yeah, so uh, it donates H plus to nitric acid. Okay, I, I think we discussed that earlier on. So again, um, if I were to show you, your nitric acid looks like this. Okay, so uh, in the presence of corn sulfuric acid, uh, the O here will be protonated. And then uh, after that, this whole portion will be lost. Okay, and then, um, okay, this part, it removes water, thus preventing um, equilibrium from being uh, re-established, from being established, right? Okay, so this is a relatively weird phrasing, uh, I feel, because um, um, it doesn't, it doesn't, in that sense, remove water, but it um, protonates nitric acid, and then um, in the process, generates water, in fact. Okay, so uh, although it's a dehydrating agent, so you may think that hey, dehydrating agent isn't removing water, but, but a more accurate answer is actually uh, discussing um, its role. What does it do to nitric acid? So C would be the definitely the best answer here. D is definitely definitely uh, a wrong answer because this equilibrium establishment um, is a bit iffy. Uh, I think earlier on, we don't have any um, situation where we need to talk about establishing equilibrium. Yeah, so I don't think um, you want to choose something so remote as your answer. Okay, and then um, for three, when benzene decolorize equals bromine when warm in, will benzene decolorize equals bromine when warm in the presence of um, uh, anhydrous iron 3 chloride? Okay, so of course I, I need to be very careful here. I just really need to make sure that it's anhydrous iron 3 chloride, right? And then explain your answer. Yeah, so of course, uh, I would expect, yes, the colorization um, uh, will definitely take place. The reason is uh, the presence of iron 3 chloride together with bromine, right, will generate the um, bromonium, elect the bromine electrophile. Okay, bromine electrophile plus Fe. Br4 minus. So this itself decolorized equals bromine. So the bromine electrophile will then uh, react with the benzene ring. Okay. So in this case, um, the decolorization actually doesn't quite come from benzene, but it actually comes from the generation of the bromine electrophile. 
uh, when bromine reacts with anhydrous iron 3 chloride. But in this case, yes, reaction does take place. Okay. Um, and then we have question four. Does draw the organic products when benzene is warm with BrCl and uh, anhydrous iron 3 chloride? Okay, so this is kind of like a trick question because um, first of all, right, we need to understand uh, the polarity difference between Br and Cl. So Br and Cl, right, chlorine is more electronegative, uh, bromine is less electronegative. So if I'm going to add this to FeCl3, right, if you understood what I said to you earlier on, yeah, the C Br bond will break actually towards the Cl, okay, and in this case, uh, it will generate the bromine electrophile and uh, FeCl4 minus. Yeah, so because bromine electrophile is being generated, um, and benzene is present, so I would expect methyl sorry, uh, bromo benzene to be the product which I'm going to draw. Okay, yeah. For question 4.2, I'm sorry, SI 4.2, right? We have bromination of benzene in the presence of uh, ALBR, ALBR3 represented by the following mechanism. Enthalpy change is negative 43 kilojoules um, per mole, right? So uh, straight away, I will cross out these two options because your enthalpy change is negative. So exothermic reaction. Okay. And then... Um, I mean, I can also cross out A la, as if because A is not exo, okay? And of course, uh, yeah, quite a dumb question, but yeah. So D is actually um, the correct answer, and we can tell that because in generating the electrophile, or rather in generating the carbocationic intermediate, right, um, it requires the most energy. So the first step is actually the activation barrier. The second step is almost barrierless. Yeah, because uh, basically the AL... Um, the ALBR bond, okay, will break, and then it will abstract one of the H, one of the H from the uh phenol ring, okay, and then in that in in, in that sense, you will regenerate the um uh, aromaticity of the benzene ring, yeah. So definitely, D will be the best option here, okay. Okay, so for four point four, right over here, um. Electrophilic substitution with halogenol alkenes. Yeah, so he has a special name. He has a historical name. We call it Frieda Kraft alkylation. Uh, it's an interesting name. Um, the scientist Frieda and Kraft. Yeah. Um, what does it do? Basically, the same same role. Okay, similar role. So if you understand what we said earlier on, um, so we if you have uh, chloromethane then you know that um, the CCL bond is now polarized towards the CL. Okay. Then uh, if I would add ALCL3 over here, right? So the sigma bond will then be broken towards the CL and then uh, be linked to the AL. Yeah. So in, in, in this case, right, I will be able to generate the metal electrophile and at the same time, uh, ALCL4 minus. Okay, so when I generate the metal electrophile, uh, this is the electrophile required for electrophilic substitution. Okay, and that is why I get metal benzene as the uh, product, which is one third. And of course, HCl as the byproduct. Yeah. Okay, so the mechanism is as follow. So you have um, electrophilic substitution. Again, uh, this is generated. Remember, I told you the first step. Uh, you don't really need to to show arrow pushing, but um, from here onwards you need to, so this attacks the carbon, okay, and then after that, uh, over here, so the first step, um, you, if you if you want a more accurate portrayal, you have to draw out the ALCL4 minus, with the formal charge here, and then um, you need to indicate the ALCL bond now breaks towards the H, okay, and then that's how you, you get HCL as the byproduct. Okay, and you regenerate the ALCL3 Lewis acid catalyst. Okay, it's quite similar, so I don't think um, uh, we need to go into a lot of details. If you if you look at the summary, uh, not summary, but if you if you just glance over the first two reaction, which which is electrophilic substitution uh, via halogenation and nitration, you realize the mechanism is very simple. The first step is always um, the electron density from the phenol ring will 
be pushed towards the electrophile. So a pair will be pushed towards. You generate the unstable carbocation. And then after that, um, a relevant Lewis base will come in to regenerate the Lewis acid catalyst, produce the byproduct, and of course, most importantly, um, to produce uh, the final product. Uh, in this case, um, uh, methyl benzene. But in other cases, the relevant uh, halogenol benzene. Yeah. Okay. Then, of course, uh, we have exercise uh, 4.3 over here, um, asking you to describe the mechanism of uh, uh, the following reaction scheme. Okay. So, uh, I think in this case, it's relatively clear cut. So, we have uh, isopropyl chloride. Uh, two chloropropane here, so um, it's now being substituted into the benzene ring. So again, the mechanism, if you if you are going to draw, you need to write down the title. In this case, it's electrophilic substitution. Yeah. Sometimes to be more exact, right? You might you might see some textbooks saying that it's known as electrophilic aromatic substitution. So it's really up to you. How strict you are. Okay, so how do you generate the electrophile? So you generate the electrophile uh, again. Um, we have a Cl here. So delta plus, delta minus, uh, plus AlCl3. So the electrophile is generated by the heterolytic cleavage of the CCl bond. Okay, and then um, in the process, I will generate the isopropyl electrophile with a plus charge in the middle carbon plus AlCl4 minus. Okay, and then after that, um, the next step will be your phenol ring, okay, will then um, approach the positively charged carbocation from the pi electron, okay, so uh, you put the arrow here, and then this is the slow step. Okay, so in the slow step, I'm going to draw in the semi-crescent, okay, like this. Okay, and then uh, with an H here and the isopropyl group over here. Okay, and then of course, um, I'm going to draw in the fast step together. So the fast step is over here. So remember earlier on, I mentioned that um, you can actually draw the ALCL4 minus so as to show a more accurate mechanism if you wish to. So uh, it's like this, like this, and like this with a minus charge in AL. So the CL. The ALCL sigma bond will break, and then um, we'll grab this H, okay? And then after that, oh, sorry, just now I forgot to put in the plus charge. And then after that, um, restore the aromaticity, okay, by pointing into the phenol ring, okay? And then um, what I'm going to get here is regeneration of the Lewis acid catalyst. The byproducts is HCl, and then of course, I'm going to get my product, which is um, isopropyl benzene like this. Alright, okay, we'll move on to section 5 on methyl benzene and other substituted um, benzenes. Okay, so for the property of methyl benzene and the structure, I think you should be aware that um, the methyl benzene contains a methyl group. Okay, so um, that's the part sticking out over here and of course um, it has a phenol ring or colloquially known as the benzene ring, okay? <clears throat> so, the portion around um, the, the phenol ring, right, you would expect it to undergo a reaction uh, very similar to um, a normal benzene. So, therefore, you expect uh, reactions based on electrophilic substitution, yeah, such as what we have gone through earlier on. Uh, for example, nitration, chlorination, or even uh, Frieda Kraft uh, alkylation. For the side chain, right, you realize that the side chain is actually a methyl group. So a methyl group um, being um, alkyl group, um, which is uh, related to alkanes. So you would expect it to undergo reactions such as a free, I'm sorry, such as a free radical substitution. Okay, pretty much um, similar to an alkane. Yeah, but the side chain of benzene, right, you also undergo a, a relatively special kind of reaction. We call it side chain oxidation. The reason why the side chain is more easily oxidized right, is really because the CH bond at the side chain is actually uh, weaker. Yeah, um, weaker in that sense, then that means that it is activated. Yeah, so activated in that sense also means that if you if you put a, an oxidizing agent next to it, 
yeah, then uh, there is a high chance that um, the electrons um, will be transferred to the oxidizing agent. And uh, that sort of constitute um, some sort of oxidation reaction of the particular CH bond. Yeah, so um, by and large, we will call this CH activation. So we say that the benzene ring actually activates the CH on the side chain, right, towards oxidation. Yeah, so uh, in particular for side chain oxidation, right, we are really referring to the benzylic side chain, meaning the, the, the CH three the carbon directly bonded to the benzene ring okay so the rest are not exactly uh, affected but later you realize that the bet the rest will also undergo some form of um uh, oxidation and then eventually you get a mixture of uh, carboxylic acid so you can get uh, quite messy okay so similar to uh, benzene it is also insoluble uh, in water so you expect it to, be, to have maybe slightly higher boiling point than benzene because of the extra methyl group uh, and in that sense um, uh, its dispersion forces between uh, methyl benzene molecules will be stronger Less toxic than benzene, I'll leave you all to go and uh, discover why. The, less, the reduction in toxicity is largely due to the fact that the, the methyl group can undergo some form of uh, side chain oxidation. Yeah, so I'll leave uh, you guys to go and explore. Okay, so for the electrophilic substitution of methyl benzene, the conditions are quite similar. So you realize that this table is really just a, a, a replica of what we have earlier on. Yeah, so uh, similarly, you use um, you, you, you still need an acid chloride catalyst. Yeah, but the difference is that the reaction um, is able to occur at room temperature. And then uh, you also need a Lewis acid uh, catalyst for the bromination. Okay, in order to prevent side chain oxidation from taking, for, or rather for, for um, in order to prevent unwanted side chain oxidation from taking place, you wouldn't want to um, have uh, UV light present uh, because the presence of UV light will will actually cause the chlorine radical to be formed and then uh, side chain oxidation might result. Okay. Then, um, so the later section will actually explain uh, why uh, bromination um, results in only the second uh, substituted product and the fourth substituted product as the major product. Why is the third substituted product the minor product? Okay, so later we'll explain to you why. And and you will be introduced to terminology such as the fact that electron donating group, donating group meaning the group directly bonded to the benzene ring at the start. Um, for activation group, they tend to be 2-4 directing. And then for uh, deactivating group such as electron withdrawing group, they tend to be three directing. Okay, you'll learn that uh, later. The electrophilic substitution of uh, concentrated nitric acid is still the same. It's quite similar. Yeah, so instead of maintaining at 55 degrees Celsius, I, I just need to maintain at room temperature. So that's about 30 degrees Celsius. Um, if you do it overseas, then um, actually you need to elevate the temperature a little bit like, because the room temperature condition uh, in Western countries, those in the Northern Hemisphere, they tend to be lower. Yeah, so about 20 degrees Celsius. So you need to elevate it a little bit. Uh, otherwise, the reaction will be very slow. Okay, and then um, for the electrophilic substitution of uh, halogenal uh, alk with halogenal alkanes, that so that's um, Friedel-Crafts alkylation. Uh, similarly, um, it will also be added to the phenol ring, except that um, later on you will learn why is it um, you why why you get the second substituted product and fourth substituted product as the major product. Okay, yeah, so. Um, there's this little note over here. The, the reagents and conditions are slightly different. Yeah, because the methyl group is actually an activating group. Yeah, so we so if you simply look at electronic effects, uh, how the electronic effect of the methyl group has on the benzene ring, right? You realize that the, the presence of the methyl group activates the benzene ring towards electrophilic substitution. And because of that, the activation barrier is slightly lower as compared to that um, uh, using benzene. Yeah, so uh, in that case, um, room temperature condition will suffice. Okay, so the later section will actually explain the effects of the substitute on the benzene ring. Okay, yeah, so there are two important effects um, you, you need to be aware of. Like, um, I think we introduced uh, some of these in in the earlier chapter under introductory organic chemistry, but but back then it's a little bit difficult because 
uh, there isn't a context um, to discuss. So over here now we have a context, so um, you might want to pay a little bit of attention to, to it. Okay, so first of all, right, donating group and withdrawing group um, is able to activate um, a, a, a system. It can be an alkene, it can be a benzene ring or whatsoever through either inductive effects uh, via the sigma bonding framework. So usually a sigma bond here, we are we, we can also call it the sigma bonding framework because the inductive effect actually uh, pull electron density, right? Uh, either towards or away um, from the source. Okay, so uh, usually um, you will hear people talking about a sigma bonding um, framework. Yeah, but inductive effect tend to diminish in strength as you go further and further away from the source. You might want to be aware of this as well. And then we have the pi effect. Okay, so that's the pi electron clock through delocalization. So the delocalization um, will actually result in um, uh, a direct, uh, either a donating or withdrawing effect, uh, which later on uh, we're going to use um, through several examples. So over here, um, we have uh, electron withdrawing group via inductive effect. Okay, by virtue of the fact that the group attached to them, right, are more electronegative than carbon. So, so in this case, the group. Um, directly bonded to the, to the phenol ring, right, is actually OH. Okay, however, uh, the atom is actually oxygen. So oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. So therefore, the oxygen will exert an electron withdrawing inductive effect on the carbon, as well as, I mean, in this case, the chlorine as well. So uh, in that sense, um, because electron density will be withdrawn towards the oxygen, so uh, it will tend to make this carbon taking on a partial positive charge. Yeah, so uh, we will call this electron withdrawing inductive effect. Yeah, what about donating effect? Because you are probably aware that uh, most of the groups are actually more electronegative than carbon or most atoms. Yeah, except for metals, okay, another group that is able to exert uh, donating effect is actually alkyl groups. Yeah, um, so in that sense, um, alkyl groups over here, uh, is able to inductively donate electron density uh, into the benzene ring um, uh, via the sigma bonding framework. Yeah. So uh, this donation, donating effect uh, is actually through the CH sigma bond okay, in this group and the donating effect um, directly raise the electron density of the pi framework. Yeah. So this effect is known as uh, hyperconjugation. Uh, but we will not cover in H2. Okay, so if you're interested, you, uh, you can read out on your own or you can um, read out more uh, to prepare yourself. If you're interested, you can take H3 next year. So we'll cover a little bit in H3. For delocalization, so delocalization um, is not exactly entirely uh, unfamiliar to you. Like for delocalization, I think uh, most of you are aware that let's say if we have uh, alternating double and single bond, let's say for a filter 1, 3 diene, right? Yeah, so uh, I, similar to benzene as well. So because the pi electron clock, the p orbitals um, on each carbon, right, are parallel to each other, so there will be a continuous overlap of uh, electron densities across the four carbon. Yeah, so... Uh, and of course, for benzene ring, you know that the electron density actually gets delocalized around the phenol ring. Like. Yeah, so this actually uh, is what we term as delocalization. But let's say, right, if you if you have a group bonded to the benzene ring with a lone pair of electrons, for example, like OH, yeah, then you realize that these lone pairs of electrons can also effectively delocalized into the phenol ring. And this particular delocalization unlike the electron donating inductive effect, right, will actually increase the electron density of the phenol ring a lot more. Yeah, so um, when it increases the electron density of the phenol ring a lot more, it will activate it towards electrophilic substitution. Yeah, so that's the terminology that we often use. But over here, you realize that the OH group, right, uh, sort of contradicts a little bit uh, from what you have over here. Because you realize that if you look at inductive effect, right, uh, OH group is what we call sigma withdrawing. Okay, there's a sigma withdrawing group, but in 
for the pi system, it's actually pi donating. Okay, it is sigma withdraw withdrawing, right, by virtue of the fact that oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. Yeah, so the oxygen is able to withdraw electron density away from the carbon via the sigma bonding framework or over the sigma bonding framework. But the pi donating effect in this case, because of the lone pairs of electrons on O, right, is able to enhance the electron density of the phenol ring uh, and activate towards electrophilic substitution. So when these two effects are in opposite direction, right, um, usually in most cases the pi effect will override the uh, sigma effect. Yeah, so if you have pi and sigma effect together, the pi effect will override. Yeah, so uh, that is something that um, I, I hope uh, you guys can pay attention to uh, because uh, it will be something which will come back and haunt you in in JC in JC two because uh, in JC two you will especially uh, encounter phenol and phenolamine and of course um for small case, for some cases or oh, um ether and of course um either secondary or tertiary amine uh, you notice that these groups uh they tend to enhance the electron density of the benzene ring despite the fact that oxygen and nitrogen are more electronegative than carbon then you might you might get a little bit confused when you are in uh, JC2 la, because if you get confused then um, you will feel that um, like whatever you learn um, doesn't seem to make sense la, but but you 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 might want to be affect, uh, aware that both sigma and pi are, are actually opposite effects yeah so if there is a decision to be made then um, in most circumstances, the pi effect will override the sigma withdraw withdrawing effect. Okay, there is of course it is also possible for you, uh, for a group right to withdraw electron density away from the benzene ring, uh, through the uh, withdrawing uh, pi effect. I mean it, it it can happen, and this is especially the case for 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 nitro groups, and of course for for C double O. And if you if I just simply illustrate this for a nitro group, right? Because a nitro group is actually electron um withdrawing at the N double bond O. Uh, so if I'm going to draw out a resonance structure, you you realize that the withdrawing effect actually withdraw electron density like this. So um you can actually draw a resonance structure with where um I will end up getting um something like this okay um this is a little bit beyond what you need to know for h2 but i'm just using this as an illustration yeah so if you did um the the fact that uh a resonance structures can be drawn when you have groups like no2 and um, um aldehyde or ketone right it shows you that um the withdrawing effect is through the pi framework yeah, because if not, then uh, resonance structures will not uh, be able to be drawn. Yeah, so uh, resonance structures, as I said um, at the beginning, is not in H two curriculum. So you do not be too worried. Don't be too worried about that. If if let's say you get a little bit confused um, with some of these ideas in arrow pushing, of course, if you have a good understanding, that actually helps. Yeah, um, but remember that withdrawing effect. Whenever we say pi and um, 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 sigma and then delocalization or no delocalization, sometimes it's very difficult to picture if um, we don't show you the resonance structures like, like what I've done here. Uh, I think just a diagram like this, although it helps, but I think in that sense, um, it might not be as useful as uh, you envision it to be. Like. But if I'm simply just going to use the diagram, then what I can say would be um, I have this electron, I have this oxygen here which um, withdraw electron density towards the O. And because it withdraw electron density towards the O, right, it kind of like make um, C, right, very delta plus. So the, the very partially positive carbon, it's something like a vacuum. La, so it will kind of like allow the other electron density here to be withdrawn towards itself. Yeah, so um, you can view it that way if you want, or if you just want a more qualitative explanation in addition uh, instead of something that is um that re that requires the drawing of resonance structures, I think this is fine. But but I have to say that resonance structures is not needed um in H two, so um you probably don't don't want to be too too affected by it. 
Okay, so the overall reactivity of a benzene ring, right? Um, I mean, or the substituted benzene ring uh, is affected by the substituent bonded to it. Yeah, so if I have an electron donating group, um, the donating group will increase the electron density of the phenol ring and then activate it towards electrophilic substitution. On the other hand, electron withdrawing group, right? will withdraw electron density away from the benzene ring and then making it less susceptible or deactivating it towards electrophilic substitution. Yeah, so I hope um, this will kind of like help you in your understanding. If you if you would prefer something of a, a, a like using an energy profile diagram kind of understanding, I think um, uh, I'm going to draw an energy profile diagram here. Uh, I, I, I just hope that you will sort of enhance your understanding as well. Uh. So um, I'm just going to draw an energy profile diagram that is like that. Okay, uh, this is the progress of reaction. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm just going to draw several things side by side. So first of all, I'm just going to draw a normal benzene ring. So uh, a benzene ring, let's say it's like this. Okay, so let's say it has an electrophile. It's the same electrophile. Okay, then uh, energy profile diagram will probably look something like this. I'm not going to draw the rest. Okay, something like this. Okay, so you realize that this is actually the activation barrier. Okay, so this is the activation barrier. Okay, uh, for, the, for this reaction. If I have an electron donating group, okay, what's going to happen? Remember that the electron donating group makes the band, uh, causes the, the, the phenol ring. Um, to be more electron rich, right? Yeah, so more electron rich also means that um, it is actually higher in energy level and um, therefore uh, more unstable, so called. Uh, okay, so uh, assuming that the transition state energy is quite similar, although mo in most cases it's not the case, okay, the starting point for a donating, for, for a benzene having a donating group will be somewhere here. Uh, so I just put EDG as electron donating group plus E plus. So you notice that the, the starting point is actually higher. What about the transition state you'll be, you, you, you'll be asking? Uh, um, the transition state in that sense should be about the same. Why is it about the same? Because donating group stabilizes transition state. But of course you can argue to begin with your molecule is very unstable. So maybe I'll just draw it about the same level, but, but maybe not the same, slightly more unstable. And then of course uh, I will draw it something like this. Uh. Okay, remember that uh, in chemistry, we we'll always use proxy in our explanation. Uh. So as in, uh, you might be thinking it's not a very fair comparison uh, because this portion uh, is, you know, um, a little bit subjective and iffy to assume that they are the same. Uh. But then uh, I think my point is it, it is a very good starting point for discussion because at least uh, we are able to explain one little thing here. So the little thing we can explain is that the activation barrier in this case is lower. Yeah. And that's why it makes it more reactive towards electrophilic substitution. Yeah. Then on the other hand, if I have a withdrawing group, my starting point is actually lower. Okay. The reason why my starting point is lower, right, is because the withdrawing group, right, um, make my phenol ring less reactive. Okay. Less susceptible to electrophilic substitution. So therefore, my starting point is lower. And then I definitely need... Um, to overcome a high activation barrier. Okay, so you notice that my starting point is lower, but I need to climb all the way up. So the activation energy again is much higher as well. Okay, so I hope this uh, energy profile diagram um, helps you a little bit in understanding it. Of course, there's a little bit of um, assumption being made. Like the assumption, of course, is that the starting point of the reactant, right? The difference in energy is more significant as compared to the transition state at the intermediate. Okay, yeah. Okay, so there's a table here that ex which explains um, the difference uh, between the inductive effect and then the delocalization effect, etc. I'll leave you to read. I don't want to repeat myself as a recorder because I think I've sort of uh, mentioned it uh, briefly earlier on. But then, of course, the question is, do we need to memorize this? I don't think you need to memorize the table because uh, a similar table, although with less detail is actually given in your data booklet. 
Yeah, so uh, there isn't a need for you to memorize this particular table, but what you probably need to do, right, is to uh, understand the nature, how the nature of a substituent uh, causes the difference in reactivity of the benzene ring. Okay, whether there's a lone pair of electrons on the group directly bonded to the benzene ring, or the lone pair of electrons on the atom directly bonded to the benzene ring, is very important to decide whether it's able to um, uh, cause the lone pair electron to be delocalized and if that happens then it will be a strongly in the case of uh, OH, OR, all these groups. Okay, however, uh, uh, strongly withdrawing groups are usually those with C double bond groups, directly bonded to benzene or N double bond group. Okay, or C triple bond N, which is a good proxy to CO. Now, or the protonated form of uh, phenolamine because the protonated form of phenolamine removes the lone pairs of electrons from the system and then generates a plus charge which allows it to reverse its behavior so from a strong donating group it becomes a strong withdrawing group okay yeah then um, you might also realize that the um, the effects of halogen is not as straightforward because halogens are sigma withdrawing but they also contain lone pairs of electrons so you might be thinking they are also pi donating but the donating effect of the halogen is much poorer than the reps because um, oxygen and nitrogen right over here uh, they are actually in the second period so second period here means that um, the delocalization can occur readily because or can take place readily because of the fact that the p orbital right are of the same size so in this case 2p yeah however for um cl br and i right because they are in period 3 4 and 5 respectively so th this actually leads to an orbital mismatch so a 3p orbital cannot overlap effectively with a with the 2p orbitals in the final ring so the orbital mismatch will cause the withdrawing i mean donating effect electron donating effect by the lone pairs of electrons on the halogen to be much poorer than it should be okay and then um uh, this also means that if i have an electron donating group i activate it will inactivate the, the final ring towards electron so therefore, the condition it needs uh, will be milder. So for example, for bromination, you notice that um, I need to warm for benzene, but I just need room temperature for methyl benzene. For nitration, I need to maintain at 5 degrees Celsius, but methyl benzene just maintain at 30 degrees Celsius. Alkylation, I need to, sorry. Alkylation, I need to warm. Okay, alkylation here, I need to warm. But um, uh, for the case of methyl benzene, just room temperature will suffice. Okay. Yep, um, I hope that's clear enough. So, uh, and remember that methyl group is a weakly activating group. So it's a, it's a weak electron uh, donating group. Okay, if you have strong electron donating group, then um, you realize that I do not need such a harsh condition. So for example, for nitration, if I'm doing it uh, to phenol, right, I do not need con nitrate acids. Uh, sorry, sorry, I do not need consulfate acid. What am I talking about? Yeah, I do not need consulfate acid as the as the as the bronze acid. Yeah, so the the OH uh, is so donating, so electron donating, or it activates the benzene ring so much that um the phenol ring itself is able to undergo electrophilic substitution um directly on the on the on the nitro group in uh, nitric acid. Okay, yeah. Okay, the next portion we have the the substituent effect on the position of incoming electrophiles. Okay, so when methyl benzene undergoes uh electrophilic substitution, you realize that unlike benzene, right, where benzene is uh perfectly symmetrical, so the incoming electrophile uh if it is added to benzene, it doesn't matter which carbon is being added to. But let's but for methyl benzene, right, there is a difference. Yeah, because um if the incoming electrophile is being added to carbon number two. It's different from, you get a different product when it's being added to carbon number three. And of course, it's different when it's added to carbon number four. So that's the difference. And then here we are telling you that um, the addition to the second and the fourth position uh, will give you the major product. 
uh, but the third position um, is the minor minor products. It's not very intuitive, of course. Yeah, and um, um, in general, you don't really get to learn the reason for H2. Yeah, so the, 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 the reason is not being taught to students in H2. Yeah, so uh, the directing effect basically uh, is actually uh, given in your data booklets. So because it's given a data booklet, you can simply just refer to them. Uh, so uh, in general, electron donating groups are two for directing. Um, withdrawing groups are three directing. Okay. So remember this. Uh, I think this is very important because beginning students usually get super confused about this. Uh. Um, the nature of the electron file is not important, but it is where the Electrophile is being substituted on the benzene ring, and this is determined by the nature of the substituent. Okay, so remember this is it's not determined by the nature of the electrophile. So regardless of whether your electrophile is is whatever thing, right? Uh, it's not as important as the nature of the substituent on the benzene ring, because the nature of the substituent will direct the electrophile to the relevant position depending on whether is it activating or deactivating. Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier on, right, activating groups will direct the incoming electrophile to the second and fourth position. We call it two for directing. The activating group will direct it to the third position. Okay, yeah. And then uh, I think you have a general um, idea over here already. But the only slight difference, the only slight difference is that halogens, right, um, despite being deactivating, right, they will direct incoming electrophile to the second or fourth position. And again, um, we, are, we will be able to understand this if you understand um, the reasoning behind the nature of the activation group, activating group or deactivating group, which we are not going to discuss in H2. Lah. Okay, so what happens if there are two groups already bonded to the benzene ring? Lah? So uh, where possible, we are trying to look at synergy effect. So if one group directs it to the second position relative to it and the other group directs the electrophile to the third position relative to that, then it's amazing. Then it's easy for you to predict. Okay, but if there's some contradiction, then then uh, usually we'll get a mixture of products. But in general, right, the activating group will direct the major product. So meaning that let's say um, there's a contradiction between the... Um, the electron withdrawing group and donating group, right? Usually the donating group will decide where the electrophile will go to. Right? Yeah, so I guess uh doing more practice actually helps here. Okay. So other combination will result in a mixture of products and then therefore uh, give you a poor yield. Okay. So we have exercise uh 5.1 over here. So uh, uh I think giving you an example uh will probably allows you to uh understand how to how to go about um, uh, predicting um, the product and maybe uh, I mean narrow down the gap on in you trying to understand uh. okay so first of all right for for benzaldehyde uh, I think you know that benzaldehyde looks like this okay so we have benzaldehyde and then we have four metal benzaldehyde okay so uh, so there are two groups here one is an electron donating group which is a CH3 uh, weekly donating and then the other one is uh, you have an electron withdrawing group which is a relatively uh, strong withdrawing groups okay so um, the donating groups okay will direct the electrophile to this position relative to it remember it's always uh, it's always relative yeah uh, so so so, uh, in case you are wondering, 2, 4 directing means what? 2 relative to what? 4, relative. okay, so it's relative to the substituent. Yeah, so in this case, the metal group is 2, 4 directing uh, relative to it. So, therefore, the incoming electrophile will be directed towards the position in indicated by my um, green arrow. Okay, um, the aldehylic group, right, is 3 directing, right? relative to itself. So if you just count one, two, and three, so it will also direct it to these two positions. Yeah, so that's a match made in heaven because it's easy to predict the product. I, uh, I hope that's agreeable. So therefore, um, if I'm going to draw my answer, I mean draw my product, I will only be drawing this 
the model nitration, right? So I will only be drawing this. Yeah, so the answer is pretty straightforward. Yeah, okay. So yeah, so this is how it works. I hope uh, um, it doesn't confuse you. Uh, I mean, when, when you're trying to um, when, when you're trying to work on the problems. Uh. Okay, then um, monobromination of 4 methyl phenol. Okay, so we have phenol here. So uh, 4 methyl phenol. So we have 4 H phenol. Okay. Um, the methyl group is in the fourth position. Okay, oh, wait. I'm sorry, I have the right on top because there's no space here. I want to keep the space for part C. Okay. <coughs> and then, um, if you notice, right, uh, what I said to you earlier on, um, the OH group is a sigma withdrawing but pi donating group. So the pi donating effect makes it a very strong electron donating group. However, the CH3, right, is actually a weakly donating group. Yeah, so um, if I'm going to just draw the monobromination product, then I will tend to follow the stronger donating group. So therefore, I should be following OH rather than CH3. Okay, so OH will direct the incoming electrophile to the second posi position relative to it. And then a um, methyl group will, will direct it second position relative to it. So you realize they contradict by as shown by the purple and the red arrow. However, if you heard what I said earlier on, I should be drawing the product. The major product would probably be the one um, that is being directed by the stronger uh, donating group. So in that case, for the monobromination, I should therefore be drawing this as my major product. Okay, yeah, because they only wanted monobromination. I think you have to read the word carefully, now. only mono. Okay, okay, so now I have four bromophenol. So again, uh, OH here and then bromo group at the fourth position. Okay, so again, uh, this is relatively clear cut as well. Be uh, because I, I, I need to follow the more um, stronger activating group. So in this case, uh, OH obviously is an activating group, but BR is a withdrawing group. Yeah, so I don't care about BR, so therefore uh, I will only be drawing the mono nitration product, which is here. So NO2 should be here. Okay, so I'm doing this a little bit fast because uh, I think 1A and B, I've already explained it relatively extensive to you, so I can do part C uh, relatively quickly here. Okay, in the mono nitration of 1, 2 dimethyl benzene, uh, a mixture of several products is obtained. And um, draw these structures products and explain why there's no one major product. Okay, so uh, again, this is a relatively interesting question. Uh, because if I have a methyl benzene, uh, um, I mean, we have two methyl groups here, right? You'll notice that uh, it's going to be quite complicated. Okay, so I think I will color code them so that it's easier for, for, for us to discuss. Uh. Okay, so the the red methyl group right, will direct the electrophile towards the second position in red relative to it and then the fourth position the blue methyl group on the other hand will direct it here and here and because both are weakly donating so the nitro uh, i mean the the, the nitronium electrophile don't know where to go lah. so the nitronium electrophile can come here 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 or here yeah so i'm going to get a mixture of four different products uh, and there's no one major product if i really want to force an answer out probably uh these two the one the two in purple will be in slight majority as compared to the other two like, because of steric yeah because um over at this position and this position right uh they are next to the uh substituent group which will exert some steric hindrance on the incoming electrophile yeah, so because of that, uh, and that is also a reason why if I'm only going to choose one product, right, uh, let's say I have um, a methyl benzene, let's say I have methyl benzene, right, um, remember that two four, it is two for the right thing, but the fourth product, usually in terms of percentages, right, it will be higher than the fourth, than, sorry, than the product in the second position. Because um, when the electrophile approaches the second and fourth position, right, uh, the second position, due to the uh, proximity of the methyl group, right, it will exert steric repulsion against the electrophile. 
yeah, so the activation barrier leading to the two substituted product is slightly higher than the fourth substituted product. Yeah, so so that explains why for question two, if I'm being forced to make a choice, then I will choose uh, these two. Meaning, um, okay, maybe I should be clearer. I, I, I will choose um, the substitution of the nitro group either here or over here. Okay, to be in slight majority, I mean not a lot more, but slightly more. Yeah, but other than that, if it's simply just based on uh, electronic effect alone, right? Then uh, whether is it here, 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 or here, I don't think there's any preference. Okay, we'll move on to 5.2. So draw the structures of the major products in each of the uh, following reaction. So we have monochlorination of nitrobenzene. So nitrobenzene here. Okay. So um, if uh, if nitrobenzene is going to result in monochlorination, then definitely it's three directing. So you'll be here. Yeah, because there's only one group. So I'm only following the NO2. Okay. Uh, mononitration of uh, bromobenzene. So I have bromobenzene here. So if I'm going to do mononitration, you know benzene is uh, a, an electron withdrawing group, but you will tend to form the two, four products. So I'm going to draw this and this. Okay, so in this case, it's relatively clear cut. Okay, and then uh, monobromination of four hydroxyl benzoic acid. So we have benzoic acid here. Uh, four hydroxyl uh, benzoic acid. Okay, so um, benzoic acid is an electron uh, withdrawing group because of the C double bond O directly bonded to the benzene ring. OH is a donating group. And if you heard what I said earlier on, uh, usually if I have a withdrawing and donating group, I will check whether there's a synergic effect. If not, then um, it will usually be dominated by the stronger activating group. Yeah, so um, the electrophile will therefore be found at the second position relative to OH. So it will be found here. But at the same time, this is also the third position relative to the carboxylic acid. Yeah, so it's like a match made in heaven. So this is the only product I'm going to get. Okay. Then for mononitration of four amino methyl benzene, so again, um, uh, I have methyl benzene over here, and then uh, four amino is NH2 over here. So as uh, what you might have remembered earlier on, um, NH2 is actually a stronger donating group as compared to CH3. Why is that the case? Because it has a lone pair of electrons over at the end which can partially uh, overlap with the benzene ring or we can say that it's delocalized in the benzene ring so it will enhance the electron density of the benzene ring towards electrophilic uh, substitution yeah so because of that uh, i although methyl group is electron donating but methyl group the donating effect is true it is an inductive uh, donating effect so it's actually weaker than the pi donating effect by the nh2 so therefore uh, the the major product should be the substituent um, occurred at the second position, which is here. Okay, yep. <clears throat> I'm going to move on to um, uh, the next part, which is on um, side chain oxidation. Okay, or rather side chain reaction of methyl benzene. <clears throat> so number one, we have free radical substitution. So um, of course, you are aware that, uh, let's say I have a... a LQ side chain, then that particular LQ side chain is able to undergo a substitution reaction because it will behave exactly uh, similar to an alkane. Yeah. So uh, as I as we um, talk about this, you realize the condition is similar to free radical substitution, and then our observation is similar. Okay. Uh, if we want to do uh, chlorination on the phenol ring, then you should know that um, you should shouldn't do it in the presence of UV light. Okay, so uh, similar to earlier on, it is potentially possible for you to have multiple substituent product, substitution products. Okay, all right, so we'll move on to 5.3. Uh, for the first part, why must the synthesis of two bromomethyl benzene from methyl benzene be carried out in the absence of light and um, without heat? La? So again, I think we have talked about it. 
in order for uh, electrophilic substitution to take place and not free radical substitution, uh, we need to prevent the side chain from uh, undergoing free radical substitution. And the parts which activates the side chain towards free radical substitution is the presence of light. Yeah, because that will results in the formation of radicals. Okay, so I think uh, you can easily refer whatever I said um, um, to you from the notes. La. So chlorine was passed into metal benzene and reflux in the presence of aluminum chloride. This particular compound was found to be present. La. How is the mechanism for the formation of this be best described? So because it has both the free radical substitution product and electrophilic substitution products, then in that case, I will choose option A. Yeah, because... Uh, Electrophilic substitution occurs on the, on the benzene ring and then free radical substitution occurs on the side chain. Alright. Side chain oxidation is probably the I mean the the more important one. Um because I think drawing the product will be a bit of a headache for, for some students usually. Okay. So in general, um the carbon bonded to the benzene ring, right? In this case, the methyl benzene, that particular carbon, right? We call that the benzylic carbon. So, uh, it's good for you to know this particular terminology. Okay. So, in general, for side chain oxidation to take place, right? The benzylic carbon uh, must contain hydrogen. Yeah. So, the presence of hydrogen, right, um, will allow side chain oxidation to take place because that exposes some weakness in the structure. Okay. What? I, I kept saying some weakness, right? Okay, the thing is, um, you notice that in, let's say, uh, methyl benzene, right? Not all the CH bonds are the same. Lah. Okay, so the CH bond in uh, the benzene ring, right, is actually a sp2 CH bonds. So, um, so, uh, so this is actually a sp2 uh, CH. Okay, so this is a sp2 CH bond. Okay, but the... But this particular CH bond, right? Not only not only is it sp3CH, okay. Not only is it that, but this particular carbon is the benzylic carbon. Yeah. So that means that this particular uh, CH bond is activated because um, it's able to drive the formation of a species that is likely to be relatively stable. Uh, so in that case, uh, potentially I can form a benzyl radical. A benzene radical is definitely stable because the lone electrons can potentially delocalize into the benzene ring. Yeah. So because of the fact that it exposes a weakness in the structure, that makes the CH bond um, directly bonded to the benzene ring more susceptible to oxidation. Yeah. So if I'm able to subject it to a strong oxidizing agent, for example, um, KMnO4. So only KMnO4 works here, by the way. Only KMnO4 works here. So a strong oxidizing agent, right? Then I would expect uh, it to be oxidized and give me um, my oxidation product. So in this case, the side chain oxidation product is actually uh, benzoic acid. Yeah. And then over here, uh, I think we try to describe to you uh, why is that the case. Lah? Because you, you need to ensure that your benzoic carbon, right, must contain at least one hydrogen. And, and you notice that this equation is not balanced because the rest of the species is quite complicated. Like, there are other things. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, once I have a benzylic carbon uh, containing a H, then oxidation can take place. And once oxidation take place, takes place, right, then it will continuously oxidize to give me other things. Okay. So, uh, I, I think over here, they have some description. So, for example, I have Instead of methyl benzene, I have ethyl benzene, right? Yeah. So you notice that um, this group is gone. Okay, this group is gone. And then uh, result in CO2 and H2O being formed. And then, of course, the, the benzylic carbon results in the formation of benzoic acid. Okay. Some of you might be might be wondering why. How come, like, um, how come even if the side chain is a propyl group, right, I still get benzoic acid and then um, and then the rest oxidize to uh other forms of carboxylic acid. So maybe I can explain a little bit um, in using the empty space below. Okay. Um, and then so that later on I don't have to explain too much. Okay. So remember I was sort of saying that um, if I have a phenol ring, okay, and then um, I am bonded to 
let's say methyl benzene, for example. Sorry, ethyl benzene. Okay, so the parts, the portion that is activated towards oxidation is actually these two, what we call the benzylic uh, hydrogen. Okay, and um, remember the weakness in the structure is actually the, the CH bond. So uh, the presence of the benzene ring okay, next to a CH2 group right, will activate the CH group towards um, oxidation. But it's a weak activation. So the, the um, condition needs to be quite harsh. So in this case, we are using potassium permanganate, which is a very strong oxidizing agent. Yeah. So uh, I'm not going to go into details the mechanism, but the, the first instance of the product, right, when the CH bond gets oxidized, right, is actually an alcohol. So I, I think I can mention this to you. Like. It's actually an alcohol. Okay, so the first product is actually an alcohol. Okay, and later on you're going to learn um, in the rest of the organic chemistry that um, the alcohol, right, um, is will also be oxidized further in the presence of um, uh, an oxidizing agent. So alcohol itself is susceptible to oxidation because the presence of the alcohol, right, Okay, uh, again, the same thing results. Lah. It will also further activate this CH group for further oxidation. Okay, so I'm not going to go into details, but yeah. So again, um, it will be oxidized to a ketone. Okay, so again, I, I, I don't want to stress too much on this, but um, this is really to debunk uh, a lot of myths uh, surrounding. Sometimes students don't really understand. They feel that you just memorize, but actually you don't really need to memorize because you can actually understand it simply by understanding that um, a, a, a group, or especially in this case, in our case here, we have an electron withdrawing group, right? All these groups can actually activate the CH bonds. So the presence of a C double O, right, will activate this CH bond towards oxidation. Okay, yeah, so it will expose weakness no bond. So again, um, then after that, you realize that uh, that CH bond will be oxidized uh, further. So it will be oxidized to um, an alcohol. Okay, so there's an OH here. Okay, and then of course, uh, this is a primary alcohol which uh, will result in further oxidation. So uh, again, I will not go into details, but if you remember from your alkene, uh, yes, so... This portion will undergo further oxidation to give you um, an aldehyde and then, of course, a uh, carboxylic acid here. Okay, and you'll notice that now I have two electron withdrawing groups. So these two electron withdrawing groups will further weaken this, um, um, this bond, this particular sigma bond over here. Yeah, so after that, it seems to be behave like oxidative cleavage. And then uh, eventually, I'm going to end up with um, benzoic acid and of course, um, and carbonic acid, lah, similar to oxidative cleavage. And then of course, carbonic acid is not stable, so it will further uh, decompose to give you CO2 and H2O. Yes, so all these are quite similar, you notice, similar to um, the oxidation of alkene. Yep. Okay, then... Um, going to move on um yeah so i don't think i need to explain in detail like what exactly will happen here okay uh because i, I think it's being shown here so you can sort of understand it step by step uh if you just go through what i've explained to you earlier on above on page 122 in blue right i think you should be able to understand um why eventually you'll get a benzoic acid and you'll get this particular uh uh Carboxylic acid, ethanoic acid in this case. Yeah. But remember that um, we do not need the students to draw the ethanoic acid in most cases. We just need you to draw the benzoic acid as a prediction of oxidative cleavage products. Okay. For tertiary benzene, uh, I mean tertiary butyl benzene, we said no reaction. I mean, we, we wrote here no reaction on paper, but in actual fact, if you hit it long enough, there will be some reaction. And I think you will be doing this particular lab next year. I mean, as in trying out this reaction. Uh, as to why, when I keep hitting it, you will undergo reaction. I think uh, I, I shall probably explain to you a little bit more in the classroom rather than over here. Yeah, but I mean, the truth is, uh, again, you might have predicted earlier on. 
um, the presence of groups, in this case phenolring, will result in some form of CH activation towards oxidation or even reduction, in this case towards oxidation. So if it's being activated towards oxidation, um, despite the benzylic hydrogen not having a, a H, right, uh, it will also have some effect on the H further away. Yeah, so uh, it will be a cascading effect. So that's why if I reflux, 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 I knew long enough, right, something will happen. Okay, but I will not go into details. Okay, so um, yeah, for further application, you, you might be interested uh, to know that um, even for a system like this, it will also undergo some form of side chain uh, oxidation. I think you should be able to understand this already because uh, I think uh, in, in my examples earlier on, right, I mentioned that the presence of C double bond O, right, will activate the CH group towards oxidation. So, yeah, so I think it's no surprise that you will get uh, CO2 here. Yep. And then earlier on, I think I also mentioned that um, the presence of OH group right, will also activate one of the CH uh, bonds here towards oxidation. Yeah, so uh, then eventually um, you, you will still get your side chain oxidation uh, products. Lah. Yeah, so um, if you want me to illustrate for you, then um, uh, this particular OH group okay, will activate one of the CH in the CH3. Lah. So in this case, your first oxidation product is actually this. Okay, so this is your first oxidation product. And then later on, it will be oxidized further. Okay, so I'm going to erase this. It will be oxidized further to uh, carboxylic acids. Okay. And then, of course, once it's oxidized further to this particular carboxylic acid, right, the presence of the withdrawing CO and C double bond O, right, will weaken this bond and then it will cleave. So once it cleave, the first product which I'm going to get will be CO2, that's right, CO2 here, and then I'll get this ketone. But this ketone, right, will further cause the CH bond to be activated again, and then blah, blah, and then you will continue to be oxidized until you get benzo acids. Okay, yeah. I hope you do not feel that it's pseudoscience because uh, uh, th there's of course a reason why we don't want to go into the mechanism with you guys, lah, because there isn't a need to, because it is simply just uh, some form of CH activation uh, kind of reaction and um, I wouldn't say it's poorly studied but I would say it's more of uh, the details are not really essential in, um, in in your learning yeah but what is more important is uh, for you to be able to predict the product okay we have exercise 5.4 here write a balanced equation for the side chain oxidation of this in um, acidic medium yeah so I think the easiest way is for me um, to uh, write the product first. Okay, so I have this. Okay, so um, I'm going to, just going to put an M, sorry. I'm going to put some space here and then O. Okay, arrow. And then um, my products will likely, uh, will likely be benzoic acids. Okay, so um, benzoic acids. And then the remaining two carbon will become CO2. So I'll have two CO2 here. Okay. Then I'm going to count the total number of H's. Okay, to be fair. So in this case, um, the, the number of H will be 3, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So I have 12 H. Uh, so I have 12 H. But uh, six of it gets retained. So therefore, uh, I will have 3 H2O here. Okay, so I have 3 H2O. Then uh, I will do a quick calculation um, in how many O's are there in total. So I have uh, 3, 7, 8, 9. So 9 O. So that's 9 O here. Yeah, so that's how I do the balancing. Okay. And then acidic medium. So I might just want to put in KMNO4, acidify with H2SO4. Remember, remember that the acidifying acid is important. So it's actually H2SO4 aqueous. It's dilute acid. Don't need concentrated acid, huh? Just dilute acid will do heat. Okay, yep. And then um, uh, for this particular product, okay, for the next question, um, we have the band, we have this particular uh, side chain. Okay, so um, it looks like this. Yeah, so plus how many O's? Okay, 
Yeah, so again, um, we'll get benzoic acids over here. Okay, and then um, you might notice that um, this portion, right, um, from, from the earlier example over here, yeah, will actually be cleaved to give you the uh, ethanoic acid. Okay, so uh, if you if you are able to, you can just predict this will be cleaved somewhere here. Okay, and then um, I'm going to get uh, ethanoic acid. And then, of course, uh, the remaining one will give me CO2. Okay, uh, if I want to do a quick count, uh, what's the total number of uh, uh, H2? Two O being released, I can I can I can just count here. So uh, I have uh, five H six uh, seven eight eight plus six is fourteen. Okay, how many H do I have here? Five six seven uh, eight nine ten. So fourteen minus ten is four. So I have two H two O. Yeah. So therefore, the total number of oxygen here would be uh, four five six seven eight O. So that will be eight O here. Okay, so I'll in, input the same condition. Okay, some of you might be wondering, is it okay if if this portion um I I I, I simply write it as CO2 and H2O? Actually, in most cases, yes, lah. But I think uh, over in Hua Chong, we will just try to uh make you draw the or make you predict uh, the more likely the most likely product, and that's why um we went through a trouble in um. Uh, uh, showing you uh, where it should be, where it should be cleaved. Lah. Okay, so I hope um you 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 understand a little bit better from here. Okay, and then of course um this particular section oxidation occurs in uh, alkaline medium, so uh so we we'll try to draw it. So again um we look out for a weakness in the structure, so the weakness in the structure will likely occur in the CH part that is being activated over here. Okay, so um, because it is being activated over there, then um, we will therefore draw the uh, structure out over here as well. Uh, okay, so like this, like this, uh, one, two, uh, like this. Okay, and then um, plus how many O's? So if you if you need to incorporate the O's, you can write that in. Um, and then um, in this case, it's KMnO4 with sodium hydroxide and then uh, heat. Okay, yeah. So because I have, uh, I, there are two portions which can be undergo such oxidation, right? So my products will be uh, dicarboxylic acid. But in this case, alkaline medium, so I will get dibenzoates. Okay, O minus and then Na plus, Na plus. Okay, over here and then of course the the remaining portion. Uh, if you do a quick count, is one, two, three, four, five. So there will be three carbons. So the remaining portion, three carbon will be uh, benz um will dicarboxylate with a Na plus here and a Na plus. Okay. Then the total number of uh, oxygen. Okay, we need to look at um, how many hydrogen is being uh, released. So uh, here we have 2, uh, 10, 14. And then over here we have 4, uh, 5, 6. Okay, so we have 4, 5, 6. So that's um, over here, that's 3 H2O. So therefore, the total number of oxygen I'll need will be 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So uh, it's 11 oxygen over here. Okay, so I think you can double check to check if the if the balancing is right. I think other than that, it shouldn't be a major issue. Okay, yeah. Okay, the last part on section 6 is actually on distinguishing test. Okay, so for the distinguishing test, we use it um, as a means to test um, for the difference between, say, an alkene and, let's say, a benzene ring. Okay, you will learn more of its other uses uh, when you learn more functional group. Lah. But for, I think for in this in this case, it will be relatively straightforward. So, for example, um, we are trying to, to, to differentiate between one methyl cyclohexene, which looks like this. Okay. Um, oops, one methyl cyclohexene, which looks like this, 
and and maybe um and a benzene ring. And because one methyl cyclohexene has a CC double bond, you know that um if I just do it in the dark, I add um aqueous I mean bromine dissolved in CCL4, I add it drop wise, limited portion, right? Then um the cyclohexene will undergo uh electrophilic addition. But without the halogen carrier, your phenol ring will just remain as a phenol ring. I mean, but the benzene ring will just remain as a benzene ring. Yeah, so uh, in this case, I expect um, the bromine um, to remain red, reddish brown in benzene, and then it will decolorize in uh, one methyl cyclohexene. Okay, but you just need to be aware that um, uh, you, you, you need to uh, ensure that UV light is not present. So, I mean, in case they are asking you to compare between... Um, one methyl cyclohexene and one uh, and methyl benzene. Ah, and then and then once you have UV light, you know that all hell break loose uh, because um methyl benzene can undergo free radical substitution. Okay. Yeah, so uh aqueous bromine can also be used to differentiate uh between alkenes and uh arenes. Uh, so so uh, again um uh, actually it's a better example as compared to uh bromine in CCL4 because I think number one, dissolving in water is actually more environmentally friendly as compared to uh, dissolving in organic solvent where you have to find a way to dispose it. Yeah. Okay, so um, take note of the difference in the color. Uh, bromine is reddish brown in uh, organic solvents, but it's actually yellow orange in aqueous medium. So there's a difference in the color. It's actually in the second last page of your data booklet. So please keep a lookout for it. Okay, so the difference between aqueous bromine and bromine in CCL4, right, I think it's good to know is that free radical su substitution usually does not occur in aqueous medium. Yeah, so it's difficult for free radical substitution to take place in the presence of water. Uh, I think for reason which we will not discuss in H2. Yeah, so, uh, and also, as I said, aqueous bromine is more environmentally friendly, so I would actually prefer it if I'm doing the reactions. Okay, yeah. So, um, heating with KMnO4 and H2SO4, you can also use it as a form of distinguishing test. So, for example, uh, if I have a terminal alkene, terminal alkene as in the, the, the CC double occurs right at the end of the chain, and then there's a CH2 right at the end. And if you recall from your side chain oxidation, or rather oxidative cleavage, you notice that uh, the terminal CH2 right, will actually be oxidized to CO2. And if you bubble it into lime water, it will give you a white PPT. Okay. Um, however, for um, methyl benzene, right, if you if it undergoes side chain oxidation, right, um, you will actually get just the benzoic acid, and the benzoic acid in aqueous medium will appear as a white PPT. Yeah, because it's um, not very soluble. And then, of course, there's no effervescence. Uh, because Why is it no effervescence? Because uh, methyl benzene only gives you benzoic acid. Yeah. Unless I want more, like CH2, CH3, then uh, the remaining portion can give me CO2. Yeah, if not, in that case, I, I shouldn't get anything beyond um, beyond just um, benzene. I said, I said sorry, uh, beyond just uh, benzoic acid. Okay? Yeah, so as we mentioned earlier on for tertiary methyl benzene, um, I mean, as a textbook example, it shouldn't undergo any reaction with chemical. For. Of course, in most cases, if you don't heat it for, to too high a temperature, even practical for practical purposes, right, it also will not undergo such an oxidation. Yeah, it is only when you heat it until very high temperature that things can happen. Okay, so if you want to use it as a distinguishing test between uh, methyl benzene and tertiary methyl benzene, you can do that. So just add acidified uh, potassium permanganate drop-wise into um, your organic compound and then you shake it, warm it in a water bath. Don't reflux. Huh? Remember for distinguishing tests, please do not write reflux because uh, distinguishing tests are supposed to be simple tests. So simple tests meaning uh, there shouldn't be complicated setup. So reflux is not allowed. Okay, so just uh, a simple distinguishing test will do. I mean, uh, either you warm it in a water bath or you just add the test tube chemistry, remember. Okay, so for methyl benzene, you realize chemical for decolorize, and because you know that you are getting benzoic acid, so solution will turn cloudy lah. So you're going to you should write that um, you get white PPT of benzoic acid. For tertiary butyl benzene, um, if you don't warm it, 
I mean, over too high a temperature, then um, the KML4 should remain purple. Okay, so no white PPT. Then for exercise 6.1, you are supposed to suggest a simple chemical test to distinguish between each of the following pair. So I have one methyl cyclohexene and methyl benzene. So again, um, as I mentioned, as kind of mentioned earlier on, this should be pretty straightforward like, because um, one methyl uh, cyclohexene um, versus uh, methyl benzene, right? The only difference is that um, methyl benzene has an aromatic um, ring and then um, your one methyl cyclohexene do not have. Like. So if I were you, I will simply just use um, aqueous bromine. I think aqueous bromine work. Yeah. So I'll just add uh, aqueous bromine drop wise to, to, to both unknowns. Like. So I, I would expect uh, yellow orange aqueous bromine to decolorize in one methyl cyclohexene, but you'll remain yellow orange in um, methyl benzene. Yeah. So uh, that is something that uh, I, I, I guess you have to be familiar with. Okay, yeah. Um, the next part would be benzene and methyl benzene. So again, um, so methyl benzene is here, so I'm not going to draw. So for benzene, uh, benzene on its own does not undergo any form of oxidation. Yeah, but for methyl benzene, um, if I input KMnO4, you know that it can undergo side chain oxidation. Yeah, so uh, your purple aqueous KMnO4 will be colorized, okay, but for methyl ben uh, sorry, for benzene, it will remain colorless. Yeah, so I think exercise 6.1 is a, a pretty simple example to showcase to you uh, uh, some simple distinguishing tests which you can uh, probably use. Okay, so um, well, that's almost the end of the uh, of the lecture already. Um, just just left with some summary boxes which uh, I need you to go and fill them on your own. I think um, it's time for you to maybe uh, get your hands dirty and do some of these works before you start on your tutorial. So please go and uh, fill them on your own. I don't think um, you need um, me to really write them out. And then. The last few pages will be some additional background information on um, why are certain groups 2,4 directing. Uh, for example, why is activating group and halogens 2,4 directing? Uh, why is electron withdrawing groups, de or rather deactivating group, are 3 directing? Yeah. Um, the main idea is that uh, you have to draw the resonance structures. I think earlier on, I have roughly showcased to you uh, if you treat the benzene ring as um, cyclohexatriene, uh, then um, you are you will be able to after the intermediate has been generated, you will be able to find out where the position of the carbocation is, and the relative position of the carbocation right will allow you to determine um, whether one of the resonance structures is more stable than than the other one. And if all the resonance structures are, 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 are relatively uh, the same, then you definitely choose the position where the two resonance structures are the most stable. Okay, so I will just do a simple illustration here because I think there are, um, I think our notes, uh, we incorporate quite a bit of examples uh, for you. So if you are interested, you can read them on your own. But uh, I will just use the, the little bit of space here to, to illustrate to you. And then, uh, and then with that, I will, end the, I will end the session. So let's say I have a, uh, let's say I have a benzene ring over here. And then I, I draw an um, electron, uh, I'll draw a substituent group, let's say CH3. La. Okay, so um, basically for an electrophile, right? Uh, if I allow this pi electron to attack the electrophile. If I'm drawing the substitute, if, if I draw it at the second position, so basically the third position will take on the positive charge. Lah. I hope you can easily see that. Then um, if I'm drawing it, so this is uh, two position. Okay. Then... Um, if I'm going to draw it at the third position, then the second position will take on a positive charge. Okay? Then if I'm going to draw it at the fourth position, okay, 
Of course, to draw at the fourth position, I cannot attack from here. Okay, I I will have to attack from um the other pi bond. But as you know, the pi bonds are all the, the they are all the pi system is delocalized, so it doesn't matter. Okay, but anyway, I'm just going to draw it for illustration purposes. Okay, so I'm going to end up with something like this, like this, like this, like this. Oops, sorry. Um, okay, E is here. Okay, so there's a, a blast charge over here. Okay, so what exactly is happening is that uh, I'm sure you are aware that the positive charge, uh, because, I mean, from what we were discussing earlier on, um, like these five carbon, so in this case, carbon one, two, three, four, five, right? Uh, they are all sp2 hybridized. So that means that the positive charge can effectively delocalize amongst these five carbons. Yeah. So what, what we can do is we can effectively draw some for resonance structures for that. So uh, so we can just shift the pi bond around. Uh, remember, that is actually a misnomer. It's not really shift the pi bond around, but um, I think for illustration purposes, it's easier. Yeah. So if we shift the pi bond around, and then you realize that... Uh, one of the resonance structures, right, actually contains or actually allows the positive charge to be directly, I mean, the positively charged carbon, right, to be directly bonded to the uh, electron donating group. So that means that um, this particular resonance structure, right, is kind of stable, you know, more stable than the rest. But as I said, uh, um, and, or as we said earlier on, you cannot take each of the resonance structures as though they are separate entities. So actually on the whole, if you look at this whole system collectively, right, um, it will be more stabilized than let's say uh, this particular system. The reason why it's more stabilized right, is you notice that when you try to draw the resonance structure, um, it is not possible for you to get the positive charge directly below the electron donating group. Yeah, so if you try to draw it, you'll notice that it is not possible. Yeah, so uh, at most, it will come here. Okay, so so that means that if I compare the one I've circled in pink versus the one I'm going to circle in orange, in general, if you, if you know that delocalized structures, they are all, you know, um, superimposed together to give you an average looking uh, resonance hybrid, right? So you will notice that the pink one is slightly more stable as compared to the orange one. Yeah, because in all the resonance structures drawing, right, I am able to draw at least one resonance structures with the electron donating group directly bonded to the carbon bearing the positive charge. Okay, the same thing can be said for, for when substitution occurs at the fourth position. So when a substitution occurs at the fourth position, right, you notice that there is a resonance structure, okay, where um, the positive charge is found directly uh, below, or rather, uh, yes, below the uh, electron donating group, similar to what happened earlier on. So I can draw another resonance structure if I want, but it doesn't really matter. Yeah, okay, so... Um, just going to draw them out. Okay, so you notice that uh, this particular resonance structure is actually the more stable one. Yeah, so I'm going to circle this in pink again. So, so both the both the portion I circle in pink, right, actually showcase um, an average resonance hybrid where uh, they are more stable than the one I circle in orange, because in these two cases, one of the resonance structures structures, right. One of the resonance structures have uh, the carbon bearing the positive charge bonded directly to the electron donating group. So this actually helps to stabilize uh, the resonance hybrid as a whole. Okay, so if you are very interested, uh, please read through these few pages. I think it helps uh, in improving your understanding. And um, of course, if you are interested to go beyond what we have in H2, you can uh, read up on the relevant textbook. I think I've done. I've uploaded a um, open source organic text in our Google Classroom. If you wish to, you can uh, take a look at, at, at it. And then um, I think uh, you will be able to explore a lot more on your own. Okay, so with that, I'll end um, topic 12. And then uh, I think this should be the end of the organic chem series uh, before the promos. And then um, 
the next topics which you're going to do in organic chem will be hydrogen derivative but that will be when you're in J_C two